Hello and welcome to my best of 2023. The way this video is going to be structured is kind of weird. It's going to be a mega cut of all the sauce videos I've posted this year for the first part. Then the second part is going to be an actual best of for all the gaming videos I posted on both this channel and the two I posted on my second, but I'll get into that later. I'm going to talk a bit about this channel and the goals I have for next year. So if you want to skip straight to the sauce portion, go to this timestamp. And if you want to go to the gaming videos, then go to this timestamp. Now then, 2023 has been an amazing year for the channel i think i said that same thing last year and the biggest accomplishment the channel had was hitting a hundred thousand subscribers which is actually amazing to put it in perspective i started this year at around thirty-five thousand, meaning we gained 65,000 subscribers this year which is way more than the population of cities like little elm texas and lincoln california we also gained 6.6 .6 million channel views which that's just a lot of views i, I don't know what to say and you guys watched my videos for a little over 20 21 years, which is literally longer than I've been alive. Sure, my content did switch up at the start of the year with it switching from like sauce to overwatch, but it changed back and honestly that was for the better. I do have a second channel where I post my gaming moments now and if you want to see that it'll be linked in the description. Sticking to mainly sauce on this channel really worked wonders and I'm glad I made that choice. Some goals I have for this year are hitting 150,000 subscribers and getting some of my audience over to my other platforms, which I mean I self promo I have a link tree with all my platforms. If you want to go check out like all the other stuff I'm doing just off screen, that's pretty much it as far as social media goes. But that's enough rambling from me. So let's get into the best of my videos from 2023. So real quick about the sauce I have for you today. It takes the perspective of the main girl throughout the entire thing. So with that in mind, what if you're a tall girl minding her own business, but getting bullied for being tall? You don't stick up for yourself. So Short King, who's also your boyfriend, comes along to stand up for you. But the two of you don't even do relationship stuff like the unforgivable act of handholding. Well, that's the story of the dojin i have for you today and yes i did that whole beginning thing because it's pretty obvious which genre of people my content is geared towards but anyway let's talk 425528 called how to advance your love it's from the absolute goat danny maru it's a tall girl sauce like i mentioned and it's pretty wholesome so let's get right into it the dojin starts out in the hallway with a girl walking and two other guys walking the opposite direction they bump into each other and the girl's on the floor which the guys berating her and calling her things like she hulk she apologizes for it but someone walks up to stand up for her. It's the main guy, Hinata, who's also the student council president. The guy from before grabs him and starts to threaten him, but Hinata grabs him and throws him to the ground, and also insults him while he's down. The two guys just leave and the girl starts thanking him for saving her. He helps her pick up her stuff, asking if she's hurt, and tells her, whose name is Mikoto, that she needs to stand up for herself or people like that are gonna walk all over her. They walk off and he asks if she wants to go home after they turn those papers in. It cuts to the two walking and there's a monologue from the girl, where she's saying stuff like, he's Hinata, who's her childhood friend and lover, and that he's smaller than her but never backs down and has saved her countless times. He tells her to tell him if there's any problems and that he doesn't want anything bad to happen to her, and she thanks him for always helping her. He's a loving boyfriend who always treasures her, and she goes to do the absolutely deplorable act of hand-holding, but he backs off and gets flustered, saying it's too early for that, and she backs off. Since he treasures her so much, they still haven't done couple things like holding hands. It cuts the next day and this girl is reacting to the fact they haven't held hands even if they've been together forever. Meanwhile her and her boyfriend do it every day and calls them slow. Mikoto thinks that he may not think of her as a girl, which her friend says there's no way that's the case. But Mikoto goes on dragging herself down, saying it's because she's not cute, tall, and has plain outfit, which gives her friend an idea. She asks if Mikoto only had boring outfits her entire life, which she says yeah, and her friend says that must be it since she's got a bod. It decides to teach her about clothes that suit her well and shows her an example which tells us what's gonna come. He cuts to a house and Hinata's sitting alone, wondering why Makoto would invite him over suddenly. But she thanks him for waiting and comes out dressed in this, saying that she just felt like wearing those clothes sometimes. During all of this though, he just breaks and she runs to him asking if he's okay since his body is burning up. But he releases and she realizes that he always acted manly, but is now blushing and she gets a certain feeling. And they do it. It cuts to the house again and she wakes up. Hinata moved her while she was sleeping and she wants to apologize for earlier, but he tells her it's fine. He goes on saying that he didn't consider her feelings and made her go along with his when he's supposed to treasure her. And he tells her to do what she wants and to not hold back anymore. She goes to hug him, asking if it means she can cling on to him like that, and says they're on track to having more good times. He says to let him 
rest for a bit and she says nope and the dojin ends overall i rate this a 10 out of 10 it's such a good read and it's very very wholesome it's just another amazing work from danny mark and just it's just so good in general i recommend you check it out for yourselves as always so what if you dumped a girl in high school i know for my viewers it's impossible but just go with it and later on she becomes your manager and had a complete glow up that's a pretty short summary but that's the story of the dojin i have for you today let's talk 479968 called when the manager i dumped in high school got a total glow up it's from this artist on screen i don't know how to say their name it's basically just about what i already said but let's get right into it the dojo starts out with a train station and some instructions on where to go to get to different places it then shows this girl who's going to rokusho with someone introducing themselves but it cuts to the same girl saying she had fun with a guy next to her loosening his tie then there's a title card just immediately but the two talk and she's really close to him and she says that he's stiff today and he doesn't know what she's talking about and that she also reeks of booze but she starts to tease him and plays with that part saying that maybe he's feeling stiff around there which he tells her to back off and she says it's no big deal but he pauses and asks if there's no hard feelings referring to high school when he totally dumped her she gets all close to him and starts to say something but gets pushed off and starts apologizing but she asks if they're really just gonna head home with how things are and asks if he really has no regrets while they do the absolutely deplorable act of hand holding she says it would make her really happy if he had second thoughts and teases him but gives mixed signals which makes him freak out they tell the driver to head towards the station and she says that she's dead serious about that which he teases her for and she teases him back and there's more of the absolutely deplorable act of hand holding but she tells him to speak up since there's a hotel close he thinks for a bit then tells the driver to head to that hotel they go there and start doing it but it cuts to a flashback it's basically just the two doing after school training for karate and them having their first kiss and they continue they finish up and he wakes up to some phone notifications and some pretty disturbing text messages since she sent a photo of the two in a group chat and the dojin ends with them taking another photo overall i rate this a 7 out of 10 it's really short there's not a lot of story to it but the art style really carried this one it's it's so good <laughs> i recommend you check it out for yourselves as always so what if you're just trying to get a convenient store dinner one night and the cashier just so happens to be a cute girl but you think nothing of it and go to a park bench to eat and as you're about to start eating the same cashier walks up and sits next to you and the two of you start falling for each other well that's the story of the dojin i have for you today let's talk 480065 called hiyoko is a busybody it's from the artist maida momo it's a pretty wholesome tomboy tag so let's get right into it the dojin starts out with a shot of food and some noises very exciting so far then it shows a guy checking out and this cashier doing customer service stuff it then cuts to a park at night with someone thinking it's still early then we see the guy sitting down with the most resentful face on him as we get some background on him like his name being Hotoro Minato who's never had a girlfriend and works a demanding office job he's tired from working and thanks god it's Friday and just decides to eat there he opens it up and wonders how he'll spend his days and if he'll die without achieving much of anything and he starts crying but this girl sits next to him and asks if his life is hard enough to make him cry he's confused and she just kind of stares at him but he remembers her as a clerk at that store and says that he goes there often he thinks to himself that she left an impression since she looked cool and she asked if he's the guy who always goes to the store at night he goes there almost every day so it's obvious she would remember him and it seems like working keeps him busy he says he's not very good at his job and goes on saying that he doesn't hate it he just falls short on everything and feels pathetic for it he then apologizes for talking about his problems and she asks him flat out if he just wants to go back to her place which of course confuses him and so it cuts to her place and he ended up going she offers him a drink which he declined saying he can't handle his alcohol and thinks she seems tough but is pretty and doesn't know what to talk about she asks if he's nervous which he is since he's never been in a girl's room before so she sets down her drink and starts taking off her jacket asking if he wants to take a bath he's stunned and she goes on saying it helps her relax and it's better to soak in the tub and it's quicker for them to just get in together and so they do it in the bath it cuts to after and he's wondering if he should expect anything else to happen after but she says he should stay the night and offers for him to get in bed he wonders if she's for real but he gets in and he wonders what this feels 
feeling is but gets excited again and they do it in bed it cuts to the next morning and there's a shot of more food but it shows him hungry and her asking if he is he looks over at her and thinks it's as if nothing happened but pauses for a bit before crying saying it's so good and she comforts him saying he's emotionally drained from working so much she asks if he has a family which he says no and that he's an orphan and she tells him that he can come by again and says that relying on convenience store food will get him sick she also offers to cook and he says she's already made enough and she offers to relieve his stress again it cuts to a subway with him thinking about that girl and what she's up to that whole thing happened a week ago and he couldn't have been dreaming it but he gets a notification asking if he's gonna come again today and there's a spare key for him and it cuts back to her place with him sitting alone he gets a message from her saying that she'll be home late and he thinks she's impressive for doing all this close to his age so he lays on her bed and wonders what she thinks of him and that her smell is nice as he dozes off he wakes up and sees her asking if he slept well and she gives him that gawk, gawk, 3000 baby it cuts to him asking her hyoko what they are which makes her disgusted she gets all serious and asks what that question was and she asks why she's going through all this for him every week but she tells him not to worry about it and he says it's not something he can just ignore since he also kind of wants to touch her which makes her disgusted again she says she wants to do stuff like kissing and it's not like she doesn't want to but doing all that wouldn't get anywhere with her but he says that he wants to do all sorts of stuff with her but gets kicked off and told not to get carried away may I actually do it this time but in the middle of this he says that he's falling for her and that's why he wants to kiss her but they continue after she makes fun of him in the middle of it again she starts saying that there was a time someone told her she's boring and not good at conversation and even during the deed so she just stayed silent for them so that's why she thought he wouldn't enjoy doing it with her and he makes fun of her this time but he says that she's kind and warm-hearted and that he's come to love her and wants to have a good time with her she calls him a weirdo and they actually finish this time they finish up and are on her balcony now and he asks why him she says i don't know but because he looks like a dog it goes on saying that she doesn't like it when she went anywhere else but that park but he asks if from now on they'll be dating and she tells him not to ask about every little thing and that it's childish to ask for permission like that but she blushes and he asks if she really loves him a lot and it cuts to afterwards and he realizes that she has men's clothes and it cuts to another day when we find out they just belong to her grandfather in the hospital and the judgment ends overall i rate this a 10 out of 10 it's such a good read i love how throughout the entire thing the two actually end up falling for each other even if it's kind of slow at first and it made it so much better because of that the art style was also really good and i actually love it but that's just me i recommend you check it out for yourselves as always so what if you're just trying to take the bus home one day and you recognize this girl that's in your class who has this sort of look on her but you think nothing of it and go on your way the next day though you see her with that same look and get worried so you check on her in her seat and she's doing the complete opposite of what what you were thinking well that's the story of the dojin i have for you today let's talk 430168 called gyaru girl climaxes on the bus what the f it's from the artist bon ho i actually found this off of a certain subreddit and the title for this was oh yes dwight d eisenhower was reincarnated as a horny japanese woman and i thought that was funny but it turned out to be an amazing read and it's of course an exhibitionist one so let's get right into it the dojin starts out with a bus and someone sees some girl that's part of a gyaru army then thinks back and how her name is Ike something and she's the scariest among them but she has this certain look today and the two see each other and he turns his head thinking he just got busted it cuts to their school and he sees that his seat's been taken over by the girl who's arguing with the group and he just wants his lunchbox and this happens for a bit scaring the MC even more so he just gives up on the lunchbox but she sees him and asks her friends about him whose name is Tsushima he yawns and heads to the bus complaining about being a health representative but he sees Ike who has the same look from before he thinks she does look hot and thinks that she may not be feeling well and thinks what her friends will say if he doesn't do anything and gulps down before walking up to her asking if she's all right but sees her pressing her stomach and blushes she starts to say something and yells at him to get off and it cuts to the next day and Tsushima's being called though he's thinking to himself about how he used her as fat material six times the day before while still getting called by someone it's of course Ike who yells at him to meet her behind the school building and he thinks that she's gonna toaster bath him but she apologizes for yesterday and he's gonna 
confused. He spoke to her because he was worried and he hasn't told anyone, but she braced for the entire school to learn that she gets off on the bus and offers to pay him for keeping his silence, which he refuses. Then she goes more in depth about this, saying that it first happened when a folding umbrella and it helped her figure that out. And also says she releases at the speed bumps in front of the post office every day, which he thinks is hot. But she says that she's grateful that he's a nice guy and he freezes. They say bye to each other and it cuts to him thinking about her while getting on the bus, which is crowded. But he sees her with a guy sitting next to her, but doesn't think anything of it. The next stop is the post office though, and he turns his head to see her and she has that same look and realizes. So he yells out to her and she's shocked. And the guy next to her asks if he wants to take that seat since they're friends. So he does and this random person is just being a complete Debbie Downer. He takes a seat and she says what a nice guy, which he agrees, thinking that she's talking about the other guy. But she says that it's him, which he says no way, since he only did that because he saw her sexy face and immediately tries to take that back. Though his blood flow says otherwise, and she says that pressing feels good and he gets worried. And they go over some speed bumps and she relieved herself and leans on him. The bus comes to a stop and he gets up to leave, but gets grabbed by her and asks what's up. She says it's 20 minutes to her house and there's no one else on the bus after that and offers to show her gratitude. And it's not like he could get off the bus with that. So he sits back down and they do it on the bus. But they get off the bus and head to her place and he realizes that he doesn't even know her first name and they continue. He misses bus and the dungeon ends with them still doing it. Overall, I rate this an 8.5 out of 10. The art style is absolutely amazing and so are the characters. It wasn't supposed to be a funny read, but it's so fucking funny. The story is fantastic as well. It's not a bad read at all and I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. Around this time last year, I made a code to generate a random sauce. The way it works is, you know, it imports random and web browser, of course, but it will pick a random number between one and this number here. It will then take that random number and input it in the URL as like the sauce number. It'll print it as well. And then it will open up a web browser the with the URL and it'll do this 10 times. What's happening today, I have this pulled up because we're going to go until I find an actually decent sauce to review. 20 minutes later. All right. So we're just doing a random number generator instead. A random number generator between 1 and 3601. And it is 96. So what if you're unemployed and can't seem to find a job? And so you go to a brothel but wasted the last of your money on pachinko the other day. But someone bumps into you and this person turns out to be a friend from college that you lost contact with. And the two of you go out drinking. Well, that's the story of the sauce I have for you today. Let's talk drunk love. As you probably saw from the intro, the code didn't work. So I used a random number generator for a different site. And this is the sauce that was chosen. But it's from the artist Shio Maneki. And it's a drunk femdom sauce. So let's get right into it. It starts with a guy in front of a brothel complaining about not being able to find a job and heading there to blow off some steam. But he checks his wallet and sees he's broke from playing pachinko. Though this girl bumps into him and he turns to ask if she's drunk. And she apologizes saying she did have a little to drink and is shaky. But the two recognize each other. Hitomi is a girl and Yoshiro is a guy. And so they go to a bar. She's drinking saying they haven't seen each other since they graduated from college. And he says that she's already become a bona fide working girl which she tries to downplay. She also offers to pay the tab, which she's relieved about. But he brings up that she's drinking with people from work, but isn't she bad with booze? She says she doesn't like being forced to drink, but loves drinking with someone close, which makes him blush, but also delusional, since the next thing he says is he really used to go after her in college, but he doesn't have a job and can't land one, so it's probably for the best they never hooked up, and starts to backtrack, saying that he's drunk. But she gulps down her drink and starts to stand while he's worried about her. But she says that he just let her in on something good, and goes to sit down next to him, asking if if he has a girlfriend. He doesn't, and she asks to say what she's been thinking the entire time. He's a bit confused, wondering what it is, and she asks if he was actually trying to go into the brothel next door. He gets a bit of blood flow and asks how she knew, but she says she saw his blood flow while he was in front of it, making it really obvious and starts playing with that. He starts wondering if she gets a bit quirky while drunk and tries to tell her not to do it there, and then they do it to each other there and head to his place to actually do it. He wakes up, wondering 
wondering where she went and starts thinking it was really just a one night stand. But then he gets called by someone and it's Hitomi coming home with sake saying they should drink every day and the dojin ends. Overall, I rate this a 10 out of 10. It's a short read, but really sweet. The art style is absolutely amazing along with the characters and it's just an overall really good read. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. What if you're a college student who just got accepted into college and go out to get a treat with this girl and you end up falling for her, but see her with some attractive guy and run home to please yourself? I don't know, this one's weird, but I'm gonna end the short summary there as to not give too much away. Let's talk 466192 called I'm in love with your glasses 5. It's from the artist Satsuki Mikazu. It's got a closed eye tag and is pretty wholesome, so let's get right into it. The dojin starts out with two people looking at an entrance board. They then find this guy, Ryu's number, and the girl, Haru, hugs him saying he did it. They get to a cafe and she asks if this is how he wants to celebrate passing his exam. But she says yeah and that he may have a sweet tooth, but eating a whole parfait is too much. She says it's okay to treat yourself and that she'll do anything for him, but he can't since she's already tutoring him, but she says she's the one that should thank him, saying that he just wants to be pampered by her and feeds him. It goes to a flashback where Ryu's talking to himself about a book reference and sees Haru there and starts to walk up to her, but sees that she's with someone and starts getting jealous thinking about the guy and if it's her boyfriend. He runs home thinking about that it should be no surprise since she's pretty, but crying thinking that it should be a good thing that she's happy. It cuts to a week later and he has no motivation to do anything. He hasn't seen Haru and keeps making excuses to avoid her. He starts tearing up thinking about her, how kind she was, caring, and her breasts, and starts thinking about her in a different way but gets walked in on by her asking if he's got a cold. But she steals my line saying, let's talk. They sit down to talk and she says that it's normal and that she knows he watches adult DVDs and knows about his preferences and all that, but promises not to be angry just to tell her who he was getting off to. So he tells her that it was her and she asks if he sees her as a woman, if he likes her and wants to marry her, which he all starts to say yes to. He gets a despaired look, but she hugs him saying thank goodness since she thought he hated her and lays on top of him as asking why he refused to meet her, but also has a weird get up. She says it's because she thought he had a cold, but she asks if she has a boyfriend. She doesn't, and he asks what about that guy from before, but that guy just turned out to be a girl, and she kisses him while saying it's a misunderstanding, and then says stuff like she's sweeter than that parfait, and the real one tastes better than fantasy, and they do it. Cuts to a few years later, and there's a church, and the two end up getting married, and she says the promise to marry her was now fulfilled, and the dojin ends with a flashback to that promise. Overall, I rate this a 9 out of 10. It's a really good read and really wholesome. It's always wholesome when they end up getting married at the end, and this sauce fits the bill perfectly. The artwork was pretty good along with the story. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. So what if you're an audiophile, someone like me who's obsessed with sound quality and will spend lots of money for good sounding audio? If you like all the Fire Force moments or if you're just a degenerate either way the sauces i have for you today are the perfect one let's talk 455707 this is the first one in this series but it's called having a blast and it's by the artist hosuke haruhito like all the rest of these like i said earlier it starts with a school and some people are talking but also making fun of this girl for listening to music by herself and her headphones saying stuff like she doesn't have friends and it's may and saying that she'll hear you but has headphones on classic bully stuff but someone calls her this guy asking about her headphones but stops talking she asks what and he says they're cool and also introduces himself as ibarra she takes off the headphones and says things and he asks who made them she then says they're romanian which he freaks out she goes on explaining that her dad's an audiophile so she got a pair he wasn't using and he asks how much they go for she says around 24,000 yen which is 200 usd which makes him freak out even more and he asks to listen to them and she asks what he wants to listen to which he says to just play whatever she recommends she says that he won't know the band and he says he knows a lot but plays something and he has no idea who it is and she laughs he says the sound quality is nice and she says that having the headphones wired makes a difference but he says the band's also right up his alley and so she offers him a cd to borrow it cuts to the next day and she hands him the cds but he also hands something to her some manga she's confused but he says it's only fair since he's listening to her recommendations she should try his she says she hardly even reads manga 
but it cuts to her apartment where she's reading and thinks it's neat. Then there's a montage of the two just hanging out, reading, and listening to music and laughing. It cuts to later and she asks how Ibarra knows about those kinds of manga. And he says he goes to a manga cafe and flips through a bunch. She's ever been though and asks what you do in them besides reading and he freaks out for some reason. He says there's nothing but takes it back saying you could go to sleep, go on the computer, play games, work, all sorts of stuff depending on the person. So she says she'll go check it out. It then cuts to her in the manga cafe getting cramped and stuff while thinking about why Ibarra got flustered earlier, wondering what he does in the manga cafe. But she opens the door to the room by hers by accident and sees Ibarra, rooster in hand and she gets flustered. It then cuts to his point of view leading up to that and it's just him doing a quickie to a swimsuit manga right as she walks in. It cuts to later and she's apologizing, getting mixed up since she's the one right next to his. But he's depressed saying that she just had to walk in right at that moment and she tries to say that it's just what guys do but that's not working. She's still apologizing and he asks to see her do the same which startles her. He says to leave but she says that she'll do it if it will cheer him up. He asks if she's serious and she is but he wants to hold her bedonkers. They just start doing it in the manga cafe. They finish up and they pay for their visit and he says that he wouldn't mind if they do it every now and then and she says not in a manga cafe though. But the cashier has one more thing to say saying they received a noise complaint and banning them from the establishment and this part ends with them apologizing. The second part starts with an entrance and the girl waiting checking her text because the two made plans. He arrives greeting Hirosaki by her full name and they get going. They go to this place and she's freaking out about doing something. That's something being he wanted to do a thousand yen gotcha. They're sitting in a diner talking about this and you only get one chance with the role and he asks if she wants to try. She tries to play it off but he hands her the phone and she taps saying it could be good. So he takes the phone and gets a despaired look saying he got takeout hot sauce and chili flakes. She laughs and made fun of the god pull he just had and he goes and gets the hot sauce and chili flakes and she gets her food but he's complaining about how his stomach will only get upset and complains about being hungry but gets a spoon to the mouth as she's sharing hers. She asks how it tastes and he says it's tasty and she says that's wonderful and he blushes. Then they decide to go to karaoke and having a grand old time there. Still at karaoke, he asks if she's free after this, but she's got plenty of time. And he starts asking something, stuttering a lot through it, but asks if she wants to go to a hotel. She bursts out laughing, saying he looks so serious that she thought he was going to confess, but says that she promised not to do it today. He says he's not after her body and wants to stay friends or more than friends, so, but she leans over and kisses him and they do it at karaoke and get interrupted thinking they got caught but it was just about their time. They finish up and confess to each other and go to pay and end up receiving another noise complaint and end up getting banned from there as well. And the second part ends with them apologizing. The third part to this has the two meeting up again saying it's been a while since that last time. They traveled far away since it would be bad if their teachers or classmates saw them since they're going to a hotel. They pick a room and continue with that whole thing and do the absolutely deplorable act of hand holding and they walk to their room but gets stopped by this guy asking if they're high schoolers and it cuts to them walking in the rain since they couldn't get to the hotel though she gets cold and they decide to go find shelter they stumble upon a hot springs and head in then go to the hot springs down the road and see there isn't a mixed bath which she teases him for but they decide to be sensible and she goes in to change he's in the bath admiring the rain but she walks in that same bath and they do it there they head back inside return their towels and are about to head home when someone yells at them to enter his office and they get banned from there. In the afterward, the author says they want to create three more chapters to this, but for now, that's the end of the series. Overall, I rate this entire series a 9 out of 10. It's really good. The artwork is so good. The dialogue is kind of short and there's not really a lot of mention of their names besides three times I mentioned, but it's really good nonetheless. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. So what if you're a happy worker who has plans to go out later with your girlfriend to celebrate her birthday, but last minute, like literally as you finish up work, she calls you and breaks up. And so your junior at work takes you out drinking instead. Then the rest is history. Not really, but there's a funny story behind why I'm reviewing the Saw series. I was vibing a few hours before writing this script and got messaged about an animated version of a Donnie Maru sauce. So I checked it out and thought, huh, this seemed very familiar. But at the time, I didn't pay too much attention to it. Cut to a few hours later when I'm looking for a sauce to make a video on and I see something in my my folder for a sauce series and sure enough when I looked at the first sauce I recognized it immediately but anyway that's enough about that like I said earlier it's a sauce series and it's from the absolute goat Danny Maru and don't worry about the 
the numbers. I'll get to them when I get to the next part in the, you'll see. And like Danny Maru's other works, they're all bangers. So let's get right into it. It starts with some guy typing away and aggressively hitting the enter key to finish up his work on time like he planned. A girl walks up behind him to say good work and also leans over to tell him that he'll be able to make it to his girlfriend's birthday date. He says it's all thanks to her and then packs up his stuff while thinking to himself about how it's his girlfriend's birthday and he got a present and dinner reservation before she calls him. He tells her that he just finished up work and will be over there but his girlfriend tells him that they should break up and also tells him that she was cheating on him and can't see him anymore. His junior is there asking what's wrong and he's in tears saying he got dumped. She's a bit stunned but gets an idea. That being they should go out drinking and she'll hear him out. So they head out going to this bar where he's still crying but now drinking and he's been talking about her and drinking for four hours according to this junior. He even had a present for her that Sushinaka the junior helped him pick out. She pats his head and he flips out which she just says that she couldn't help it since he was cute while pouting. He thinks she's making fun of him which she says not at all and thinks it's cool that he always takes his girlfriend seriously. He's just ignoring signs and thinks she's a nice person and she goes on talking about how she's always watching him from the side and how he always puts in a lot of work and effort into relationships and it's admirable even if he thought it was serious and found out that he was cheated on and even got dumped. He's unsure if he's ever gonna date again and she proposes something if she would become his girlfriend. He thinks she must be joking but is dead serious so he thinks she must be drunk and offers to walk her home since it's dark out. She says okay and there's a bunch of hotels around. They're almost at her place and he wonders if she really lives around there since the area is full of a lot of love hotels. But they arrive at her place and it's a hotel. He thinks she must be confused from drunkness but she says she's neither confused nor drunk and they go inside. The room's pretty big and he asks what's the meaning of this but she invites him over on the bed. He tries to play the I have a girlfriend card but that girlfriend dumped him earlier and she pulls his arm and gives him a lap pillow. She goes on saying that she's always been watching him the entire time and for the sake of his girlfriend he always did his best with work and love but now that he's single that means she's allowed to be madly in love with him. He's confused and she says that the truth is she's been head over heels for him but restrained her feelings because he had a girlfriend and they do it. He wakes up with a hurting head wondering why he's in a love hotel then remembers and starts freaking out but she takes this opportunity to correct him on her name Miho and hugs him saying that he shouldn't run and they continue again. It cuts again to her finishing up her work and wonders if she should go home with the guy who for the sake of this video I'll just call him senpai for the rest of it. So she walks up to senpai asking if he wants to go home together. He's got to work overtime and she offers some help which he declines. So she asks if it's okay for her to wait in his house. He says he might be late and she says it's fine and he hands her his keys. She says thanks and takes the elevator talking to herself about how it's been a while since they started dating and he lets her stop by anytime and thinks he'll be tired when he comes home and she'll prepare his favorite dish while waiting. It cuts to him finishing up work and heading home but sees someone. He sees this girl who recognizes him. She introduces herself as Shiori and they were in the same friend group in university. They rang the bell and she proposes they go out drinking and so they do. She's drinking a bunch and he was forced to go but decides to contact Miho and gets made fun of by this friend asking if it's his girlfriend which he says yeah. So she starts freaking out asking who it is and so he tells her that it's his junior whose cuteness is wasted on him and how she's better at her job and always does her best and always helps him. She gets his face and congratulates him and buys him a drink. It cuts to Miho's point of view in his apartment and she's realizing he's late. The doorbell rings and she opens the door to greet Senpai but sees Shiori carrying him saying she forgot he's bad with alcohol. She grabs Senpai and then asks who this random girl is and Shiori introduces herself. Miho asks if she did anything and then shuts the door on her. It cuts to inside and Miho's taking care of Senpai asking if he's calmed down but also brings up how it wasn't very nice that he went and got drunk while leaving her at home. She says she was worried and he says there's no option and she starts getting undressed to do it. They finish up and they're eating now and he compliments her cooking and such but also apologizes for yesterday. She says she'll forgive him but to also not feel so uneasy. But he's been thinking about something for a bit and asks if she wants to live there together. Said she's always going there every day and he thought it'd be better if they just lived together. She says of course. Of course she wants to live there together. He's glad and she says that she'll move in tomorrow since she wants to live together and wants to go shopping right that instant and then asks him to take care of her. It cuts to a few months after she moved in and they spend every day together as a couple. Miho's going home and enters saying she's home but also sees that it's empty and starts crying and running to the bed. She's crying because 
says it's lonely without him around since he's on a week-long business trip. She's gotten used to living with Senpai and it's hard for her when he's not around. She's flooded by thoughts like wanting to hear his voice calling him but he might be working and he'll be home tomorrow so she just has to hold out a bit more. But she puts her head on his pillow and smells something. His scent from the pillow and starts smelling it and kicking her feet thinking it's calming. She pauses and decides to take that time to pleasure herself but in the middle of her doing that he walks in on her. They both flip and she she asks why he's there since he said he'd be coming home tomorrow. But he rushed home after seeing her text saying that she's lonely. She asks him to at least notify her if he's gonna be home early since that was embarrassing but he wanted it to be a surprise and he also got a bit of excitement after seeing that and then they take care of said excitement. They finish up and sit on the couch and he asks if she's satisfied yet which she isn't. So she says that from tomorrow on they'll enjoy themselves to the fullest and that's the end of the series. This was such a banger series similar to the other wholesome series I reviewed from Hirio. This as well was just incredibly wholesome and straight up fantastic. Every single part was amazing even if the third one was sort of an epilogue to end it but it was still really good. And don't even get me started on the artwork. Oh my god. Just chef's kiss like way too good to be a sauce artist almost on par with that other artist i reviewed a bit back but anyway i highly recommend you check it out for yourselves as always it's been a minute since i've done one of these videos if you're new to the channel and don't know what the series is i asked my discord to send me their best sauces and some of them are very disappointing but we'll get to that later in the video i'm gonna say this bit now too but join my discord linked in the description to be part of one of these videos in the future or for future events now that that's out of the way, let's get right into it. The first submission is from Disturbed Halo 117 with the story A Gender Bent Maiden and a Confession Under a Starry Sky. It's as it says, one day his dude is just chilling with his friend and then turns into a girl overnight. And no matter how hard she tries to play it off, she starts falling for her friend and they end up doing it under a starry night. And it ends with them having a kid now at that same spot from before. It's going to be a 9 out of 10 for me, a pretty wholesome gender bender story overall. Next is 31154 six from benbot07 don't let the cover confuse you since the mc decided to confess to this girl but the person who showed up was someone completely different but she accepts his confession and now they're going out and she's nothing like the rumors he's heard and he ends up being really happy about it they go to her place and he apologizes for that mix-up from before and she tells him to leave but he says and asks her out again and they do it from there it's really wholesome and really cute and all that next is 260604 from egyptian saying it's a a nice bunny girl senpai sauce and yeah it kind of is starting out similar to the actual story if the roles were reversed sakuta disappears from the world since he dated mai and others wish he would have just disappeared as told in this long ass futaba explanation page and then they do it after some more long ass explanations and the only reason i remember this sauce is because this used to be my friend's profile picture but it's a 7 out of 10 for me simply because there's so much reading you have to do in order to understand it and even then it's very confusing next is 117424 from Rips a Fairy Boy. It's an incest one, but titled Me Stepmom's Too Fucking Hot Mate. And the entire thing is translated into an Australian accent. But basically, this guy's obsessed with his stepmom and gets caught going through drawers, and they just do it there. I'd rate this an 8 out of 10 based solely because it's really funny with the translation. Next is 452497 from Emperor Nugget. Now, I'm very skeptical about this one, but it's a tomboy who hypnotizes her friend and does it with him. And then he snaps out of his trance and is really upset about the whole situation because he liked her as well but she said they were friends it's not a very good read like it's just meh six out of ten next is three nine seven one one two from sierra 3.2 it's an azure lane parody with a lot of characters from it and there's not much else to say nothing really stands out so it's a seven out of ten next is north with three 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 five eight five it's yaoi and it has a fanboy so let's get into it these two guys are walking with flowers but see someone getting it in an alley and leave this guy's analyzing what happened and runs home to lay in bed and ends up in heat and they do it like what they saw before it's pretty wholesome and all and not much besides that eight out of ten next is berserk with four five nine eight six five this one is really long but it's literally just interspecies reviewers with elf minotaurs wolf girls 
the works. And since it's really long, I'm not going to go through the entire thing. But from what I saw, it's an 8 out of 10. Next is 470 940 from Chicken Emoji Present Emoji. It's in Japanese, but it's a Sword Art Online parody featuring Sinon, who I can only assume gets jealous of Kirito and Asuna's relationship and just does it with some random guy. 6 out of 10 from me. Next is 327 269 from Maxi Mega Me, who did my job for me. Two high schoolers try to find a ghost, and it seems like the guy got controlled. But he fights it off, and then some other things happened, and yeah. It's a really weird read, but also really funny. And it's got some good-ass reaction faces, and really good art too. 9.5 out of 10. Next is 391732 from Nokaya. It's like a one panel per page story, but some guy goes to an indie band concert, meets a girl there, they're compatible, and go out together. And she has a really dark past, that being her ex would choke her, and she woke up with scratches on her neck, but now wants to take revenge. It's really wholesome though, the entire thing. It also reminds me a lot of that bruised classmate manga I talked about, so it's a 10 out of 10 from me. Next is 267581 from Shosh. It's short, but basically the main girl and guy go drinking and they end up doing it while drunk. It's a 9 out of 10, has such amazing art, and is really cute. Next is 383892 from Asterisk. It's a prostitute Yuri sauce, and follows that, but it's really wholesome as well, since the person hired ends up quitting to be with the other girl. And it's also similar to another sauce I reviewed from the same artist, 363967. Next up is 422367 from Ollie. It's by the absolute goat, Yahiro Pochi, and it's a right to girlfriend parody, and also the sixth installment of a series. Chizuru and Kazuya go to a mixed bath and just do it there. That's the entire thing. That's it. 8 out of 10. Next is 2 from Chaotic Veteran, since they kind of tie into each other. It's about a really buff tomboy who, of course, has a bashful side. And the second one is about how she's anti-NTR and ends up pregnant at the end. Both are going to be a 9 out of 10 combined from me. And last, and hopefully least, we have 415446 from Lacquer Life. Unfortunately, it's an NTR sauce, and it sucks. I'm not even going to lie. It it's terrible. Not the art style or anything, just the story behind it. It's an okay read. The main thing carrying it is the art style, but it's such a sour note to end this video on. So instead, I have one final sauce for you. Found in my Discord as well from Penguine465120. The entire gist of the sauce is that a girl is always wearing a mask and only really takes it off when she's comfortable, which is a bummer since she's kind of cute. But I won't give too much away as I might want to go more in depth about this in a video later on but for now it's going to be a 9 out of 10. that's all from me though i said this already in the beginning but if you want to be part of future videos join my discord linked below and that i'm worried about my classmate who's covered in bruises that's not a genuine concern for me just the title of this manga i'm reviewing today however if that is a concern tell someone about it anyway this is a drama romance manga from the author kuga tsunia each chapter is about one page long until around the end and it's one of the most wholesome reads i've had in a while even even with it being really short. Because when it starts out, you think it's just a classic tsundere manga, and the bruises are because the main girl is always getting into trouble or something. But as the manga goes on, there's a deeper and more convoluted meaning behind them. And with 37 chapters out, I just had to share it with you all. Before I continue though, I do not do this manga justice in explaining the plot because it's kind of hard to with it being a POV manga. So do yourselves a favor beforehand, Pause this video, go read the manga linked below, then come back and finish the video. Now that's out of the way. The manga starts like a classic tsundere manga, and we take the point of view of the other main character. And we see the main girl, who, surprise, is covered in bruises, telling us to fuck off. Chapter 2 then brings us outside, where we're supposedly walking home with her, while she's asking if we're gonna take responsibility if we make something worse at her house. Then we go back to school, where we offer her lunch, and she declines, saying our intentions aren't clear, and tries to say she's not hungry but is obviously lying. But we see her eating after that while we stare at her saying she's cute. But she asks what's so cute about someone who's covered in cuts and bruises and wearing an eye patch. Though she tells us to fuck off again. <laughs> it then shows us giving her a homemade lunch which she insults a lot while also calling us the kind to write the girlfriend a love song which hurts the most. But the chapter after shows her talking to us about how we didn't talk with her that day since she didn't seem to like it. She thought that we'd get tired of her no matter how kind we are to her 
but realized that we're kind and wants to ask something. That being if we'd do something to her, implying that we'd cut her life short. We, of course, deny it. She then says that we don't want to save her and that we just want her happy enough to not feel bad looking at her. She asks if it feels good to take care of her and show mercy, but insults us to get off our high horse and to not use her to validate our existence. The next chapter, though, we tell her we like her which she insults us some more, calling us horny and disgusting. But the next chapter, she's covered in even more bruises, and we ask if she's okay, which she tells us it has nothing to do with us, and that if we just cut her life short, it wouldn't happen. Though we invite her to our house, and she's a bit skeptical at first, but says we don't have the guts to pull anything and goes with us. We try to tell her that we'll protect her, and she insults us some more, but says she's looking forward to dinner. We're apparently smiling, but to her this isn't just a sleepover, but rather refuge, and asks us to not be creepy and make her uncomfortable. She takes a shower and changes into one of our shirts which she doesn't like since of course we'd see it as her wearing her boyfriend's shirt we go to her about to cook even though we offer because she says that there's no way she'd become dependent on us and that she'll help however she can to not owe us the next chapter we see her crying over the meal while telling us to shut up and some more insulting but she thinks about how long it's been since she's had a hot meal and it tastes so good and there's a bit of white text bubbles now which is important later on onto brushing our teeth now we offer a meal tomorrow and she insults us some more but says that rice and miso soup would be nice for breakfast before going to bed we offer ours to her and she says no way but jokes a bit calling us gross but jokes a bit calling us gross which is improvement waking up now she asks if we're relieved that she's still there and not gone and reassures us that if we're useful to her we won't need to worry and we have one full white text bubble eating breakfast we ask if her parents are going to call the police or anything but she says that they'd be the ones in trouble if that happened and asks us to protect her to the end. Now walking to school, we say it's embarrassing to go to school together and she calls us delusional, but there's more white text bubbles. We get to class and we're seatmates with her and she says that our grin is off-putting but is undeniably us. At lunch, we apologize for not making her lunch and she's joking about how she didn't have high hopes for us anyway, but we made dinner and did her laundry and to make up for it with dinner that night. After school, we go shopping and offer to buy her clothes but she says that we've given plenty already, but caves after some comment. In the next chapter, she's wearing the hoodie and thinks our flattery is gross or not and is happy that this is the first present she's been given and she'll take care of it. It cuts to us about to cook and we forgot eggs, which she volunteers to go get since she wants omni rice, but she didn't return. The next chapter shows us her again, covered in more bruises and bandages, and we offer to go to the police or a teacher, but she wants to deal with it alone. She goes on, saying that we talk to her daily, made lunch for her, and were so kind to her and how could she ask for more she's crying asking to keep it like this since if her parents got caught she wouldn't be able to stay there which she hates most and wants to be next to us even if only for a little we bring her lunch even while she wasn't at school which it's the omelet rice she's really happy even if her home life is hell after school she goes home and hopes to see us at school tomorrow and we get our first inner monologue about how if she goes with us it'll turn out worse and if we go to the police it wouldn't go the way she wants but we have this feeling that if she goes home we'll regret so we call out, telling her that we should run away. She calls us an idiot for messing up our life too, but sighs and wants to do just that. Leaving now, we tell her that we'll protect her, but she feels safe since we're there. We're now going around with her, and she wasn't allowed to go on trips, and it's her first time going somewhere far away, which she thinks is fun with us. We're sitting outside on a bench since we couldn't get a room, and we give her our jacket so she's fine. And she's having fun alone in a park at night but we have something to tell her. We confess to her in the next chapter, which, which she tries to make sure that's okay, and we tell her everything we like about her, and we ask her out after her getting all bashful. And she says okay and to take care of her, but we see someone with a stabby stabby in the next page. Uh-oh. This lady takes her hostage, and she tells us to get going, but the lady says we aren't going anywhere, saying stuff like we put unnecessary thoughts in her daughter's head, and she won't forgive us, and then threatens to end us. She tries to plead with her mom, but gets cut off by her mom saying, Saying that she'll end both of us. We start saying stop over and over before cutting to a hospital with no recollection of what happened after. She's beside us, telling us what happened and how we got seriously injured. She starts yelling at us about how she isn't worth it and was worried, but stops and says thanks for saving her life and thanks for surviving. Her mom was arrested, which resulted in her becoming a ward of the state and we apologize for getting the police involved. She's free of the nightmare and hoped to live happily ever after with us, but what can she do? And we ask to hug her 
which got to agree with her on this one would have been a lot cooler if we just did it instead of asking it was our final day together and we were inseparable till the end we promised that we'd come see her again and it's been five years since that promise was made we meet her on a bench and start talking about how we couldn't get in touch with each other and she didn't want to be a burden but we tell her that we want to live with her which she starts yelling at us for not listening since she'll make trouble for us which she doesn't want she says that she couldn't dare ask for more after everything that happened five years ago but we tell her that she can and that we'll make her happier from now on she tries to tell us that just our presence is making her happy and her presence will just make us unhappy but we tell her that we want to be happy with her together and she pauses tearing up asking if she could really stay with us and grabs on to us confessing in tears it cuts to us asking if she wants to go there now what she calls us a creep for taking advantage of a crying girl but she knows that we're not that kind of person before going though she's hungry and wants the curry and omelet rice and there's some more dialogue and the manga ends with a literal happy ending like i said before i didn't do this manga justice with this review but this manga overall is a 10 out of 10. it's such an emotional roller coaster and i found myself on the verge of tears making this review even though i've read it about 10 times already it's such a good story and i absolutely adore it it feels as though the author knows you're always gonna feel bad for this girl and uses that to toy with your feelings throughout the entire read but i love it and hope for these fictional characters to live the best of lives continued i recommend you go check it out for yourselves as always what if you're just an average college kid who fell in love with your neighbor after an accidental sighting on your balconies but you're feeling depressed afterward because you know she was cute so you order a lot of food to eat away your sorrow though you realize that your delivery driver just so happens to be said neighbor. I know it's short, but I'm ending the summary there to not give too much away. Let's talk food delivery. I know it's a basic title based on what I already told you, but it's from the artist O22 No, and it's a pretty weird read. There's no tags I can find for it besides college and the soul, so let's get right into it. The dojo starts out with the main guy talking about how he's just a normal college student, but also fell in love with his neighbor. They don't talk a lot, but ever since she moved in, he he's been head over heels for her. That is, until one morning, he decided to step on his balcony really early, but noticed something out of the corner of his eye. That being this neighbor, topless. It cuts back to the present with him regretting his actions that day and about how they haven't talked since. But right at that moment, her door opens and he tries to mutter out a greeting that she kind of exchanges back before walking off and he's left there thinking that she hates him. He goes back to his room and sits down at his laptop to watch some VEY! He gets hungry and checks his phone, thinking that he's been getting promotions recently and it cuts to the girl's perspective she recounts that day saying she saw someone online saying there's no better feeling than morning air on your chest so she thought she'd try it but then he saw that and now thinks that things are so awkward now she thinks that he was cute too but gets a notification for an order and a big one at that it cuts again to this cross cut thing where he decides to treat himself and she's grabbing his order he checks his phone and sees the name of the driver and she checks hers and sees the address and they both realize that the other person is behind that door he opens and says hi and then takes the food after some awkward gestures from her and goes back in his home he's thinking about how awkward it is but hears an ahem and turns to see her with his drink standing in his home he freaks out about why she's in his house and she thinks that she should have just rang the bell but before she leaves he says he also forgot to give her the tip and apologizes for seeing her bedonkers she yells at him for seeing her like that and he wasn't trying to or anything and just wanted to go outside meanwhile she's freaking out saying that he must find her weird and goes on explaining the whole fresh morning air thing on the chest then says that he must think it's dumb he says not at all but we see his true feelings on that one she wasn't able to stop thinking about it and tried it but didn't think he'd be out there too he laughs saying that he didn't think it was weird and just thought she was changing or something she tells him to shut up but he says that he wasn't trying to make fun of her he just thought her reasoning was kind of cute she blushes before saying to shut up again though she says that they still aren't even since he still thinks she's weird and hates her he says that he really doesn't and she does this little tsundere thing before he tells her that he likes her which gets her to blank and he says it again she tried to be smug about it but he yells it this time and she's left thinking why did she ask that but she also confesses to him and they come to an understanding though she's reminded of something and goes back to that morning where she also saw something he's realizing and she says that he seemed quite happy to see her so who's the weird one now he says why would she just admit to looking there but he did the same thing and 
and backs off. She asks if he liked her all this time, which he has. And even if they didn't talk a lot, he still thinks she's nice and cute and likes hearing her voice. And it's not just because he saw her booba. Then they do the thing. It cuts to the two in some blanket thing, watching a movie with some dialogue and the main guy's other self coming out again. But she's getting hungry and he still has the food and microwaves it. And they go back to the blanket thing. She smiles and says that she loves this and kisses his cheek before he says me too. And the dojin ends. Overall, I rate this an 8.5 out of 10. It's a really interesting read and a pretty funny one at that. The main guy was a good difference from the norm since he gave basic answers, but the way the author also showed his true feelings on certain subjects was a really nice touch. The art style was pretty good as always. I recommend you go check it out for yourself. What if you're a lonely guy who's obsessed with a certain game and that day just happens to be a very special day for said game for some reason and you decide to take pictures of cosplayers at a convention with consent of course and they're dressed up as your favorite character from the game but one of these cosplayers just so happens to be one of your schoolmates and the two of you decide that you're gonna walk around the convention together i know it's a pretty short summary but that's where i'm gonna end it so let's talk 215077 called cosplay encounter it's from the artist batsu it's a cosplay sauce and it's got something about thigh high boots so let's get right into it the dojin starts out with a shot of this guy talking about a special event for heroic blaze then tells us what heroic blaze is and that it's a mobile game and this event is just a fan event normally he's quiet at school but goes all out on days like this with his goal being to overdose on this character from the game and at this con there's a lot of people cosplaying her which to him feels straight out of a dream he walks up to this girl and asks if he could get a picture of her and she agrees but this girl asks if he's otaki and he's confused asking if they've met before then it sets in that this is a girl from his class kikuchi he thought she was just a normie but turns out she's there cosplaying and she's a fan of the game too which is surprising since he never saw her as a type to be into gaming at all let alone cosplay she asks him what's wrong and he stutters a bit before saying that he thinks she's normally very pretty but also looks great in cosplay before immediately backing down but she asks him that since they bumped into each other if he wants to walk around and he says i guess so she takes his hand saying let's go and now he starts contemplating his choices about how he got into that situation and how they're both surprised that they're both otakus but he's fully enjoying the convention with his classmate by complete coincidence and it seems like she's having fun too even grabbing his arm and being completely oblivious to its position on her body though it cuts to the convention almost ending and the two are talking he realizes that he didn't end up getting the picture of her which then leads to her saying they should go do that now and they head to a conference room for some privacy he starts taking pictures and thinks that upon closer look her costume is truly impressive and that she's really pretty and it may be a bit late but it's a very suggestive outfit and also that holding this photo session in a conference room without permission is making his heart pound like crazy but she notices something and points to the action he's got below his belt that he didn't notice since he was too into the shoot so she pleasures him but he asks why she would do all of this for someone like him which it's all because she was happy that he complimented her there wasn't anyone around who got her hobby and the only person who's seen both sides and said they're both pretty was him plus they spent the whole day together and she thought it would just end with taking photos but when she saw his blood flow from him looking at her a switch flipped inside her or something like that and she immediately backtracks and he says that he wants to see more of her cute side she asks if he's sure which he says yes and she says if he's serious then she has no choice and they continue it cuts to them finishing up and she scolds him for going too far he's on his hands and knees apologizing since she was just really pretty she huffs but says that if he'll accept to go out with both sides of her then she'll let him off the hook he says sure and she says okay before freaking out after seeing the time saying the locker room is gonna close and the dojin ends with her threatening him saying that if she goes home like this then he's gone overall i rate this a 10 out of 10 it's really good but kind of suffers from how short it is the characters were pretty chill even if there wasn't a lot of interactions outside of this convention and the art style was amazing as well i recommend you check it out for yourselves as always okay so this one is pretty confusing not in the sense that there's a massive twist like a gender swap or something but in the sense that i have no clue who the main character is and who's narrating what i can say though is i think hikaru is the main guy and sakura is the main girl and i probably fumble these together during this review so if things seem a little off that's why but now that that's out of the way let's talk 451813 called headspace odyssey it's from the artist fushoku there's a tomboy tag and it's kind of long so let's get right into it. The dojin starts
starts out with a shot of this outdoor place with someone on their phone and hearing someone say over here. And then it shows the main girl, not guy, saying yo. The guy from before says yo back, then checks the time asking if they're gonna meet at noon, then thinks he messed up and gave the wrong time. She figured he'd be there half an hour early so she came early as well and sure enough she was right. It goes to a close up where the guy is thinking about how he and Hikaru had a funny little thing going on. They shared the same school from grade to high school as well as just about every class and tutors and extracurriculars. Their families barely knew each other so they weren't technically childhood friends but they've known each other's face for so long that they've got close in their own way. Hikaru was nice to him but was also nice to everyone offering to help people around but this guy's actively not letting that happen which I don't know why he did since he doesn't feel good doing it but still liked her kind side. She barely expressed anything let alone emoted so he has no idea what's going on in her head. So he's all like, what do you even think of me? While she asks what's up with him. He says it's a weird thing to ask, but if this is fun. She says yeah, which he thinks is a dumb line, but says it's good. But it cuts to a cinema and some more inner dialogue about how even though they aren't dating, they would go to the movies. And that Hikaru only came along out of interest for the movies. He didn't get half of the movie this time, but hanging out together is enough for him. It cuts again to them outside, talking about how dark it is and that he'll walk her home since it's on the way. Still thinking about how he should have told her how he felt directly, but he couldn't choke it out. He didn't know if it'd be better to just go home and leave it, but one thing was certain, that being he wouldn't leave until he knew how she felt. But they arrive at her place, which is pretty big, and the MC starts to say something, that being see ya, but his stomach growls. So she invites him in for dinner. So he goes in and says not to worry about him, but she says her folks are at work, which is weird for a Saturday night, but they're both doctors and out on a loan to another hospital out of town so they won't be coming home and probably aren't until tomorrow so they've got time he freezes then offers to help her out and was too nervous to taste a thing they watched another movie which has the cast playing truth or dare which to him is a good way to sour things between characters in american movies to her though it's an obscure game so what's the big deal the two ramble about random stuff like that all the time but he says that it's maybe not as big in japan because king's game is the same kind of deal and that truth or dare is too serious in japanese for a party game and picking either for yourself isn't very japanese either so they don't have the nerve to try it but it sounds fun to her and unlike king's game you only need two to play which of course would lead to the two playing and she asks him he thinks before saying dare and his dare is to give an honest answer to her question which is literally just truth but he asks what's up she wants to know if he likes her he's surprised but she curls up as he stutters to try and phrase it he stutters so bad that he coughs and she apologizes for asking that since it's not like he can just say he doesn't like her to her face but that isn't it he's not taking this lightly and was meaning to tell her himself one day but she shocked him by asking that then he tells her that he does like her and goes back to the game she picks dare and he gives her the same dare she gave and asks if she likes him and she doesn't try to play it up just saying she's the same way he pauses and she says that it's dull since they just ask each other questions so she gets hyped up and kisses him one thing leads to another and they go to the convenience store to buy condoms they're walking back and she's hyper analyzing the condoms while the two are making small talk holding hat she felt his nervousness in his palms and was happy knowing that he's aware of her and they get back to the apartment and do it they finish up in two locations and are in the bath talking about how they went and did it there's some small talk and she says that it's late if he's gonna stay over but scratches that and goes for another plan of action this being jumping on him and he pauses before saying that he'll stay and the dojin ends with her saying that's the spirit overall i rate this a 10 out of 10. It's kind of confusing because I don't know if the narrators keep switching or if Sakura was the narrator throughout the entire thing or what, but it was a good read nonetheless. The art style is amazing as always for Fushoku and the characters were amazing. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. What if the amount of times a person's heart beats in their lifetime is decided at birth and anyone could see it with a camera app? Some people would have millions, maybe even billions left. What if the girl you liked had a disease that made hers drastically lower than others? And so hearing this, you want to help her in her quest to live her life to the fullest in the little remaining time she has. So you do just that, taking her to the beach, on roller coasters, a fireworks festival, and so much more. Having fun together and learning that she can really sing. And after some convincing, getting her to join the light music club and getting to perform at the school festival. And 
to not give much of the story away, we'll end the short summary there. Let's talk Tokidoki. This is an Asas and is actually a pretty sad manga to read. But that being said, it's from the same mangaka behind Nisekoi Naoshi Komi. I've pretty much summed up a lot of it, but wanted to get more in depth about it. Just a warning before we get into it, this manga talks about death and disease, and if you're not comfortable with that, then this video is not for you. Now that that's out of the way, let's get right into it. The manga starts out with a funeral shot and a narrator talking about Takagi Hatsu, who died at age 21, before zooming in on her portrait and going to a cover image. It then cuts to a classroom with our main character's thoughts, talking about a Takagi Hatsu who transferred to his countryside school during the second year of high school. And ever since she transferred, she hasn't talked or hung out with others, but this guy is staring at her. It cuts to that guy introducing himself as Ijima Hato, who's nicknamed Popo, just living the life of a normal teen guy who joined the light music club in school. And the him right now is interested in Takagi. There's some backstory on her about how she doesn't talk to anyone at school, goes home right away afterwards, and sits out during PE. Rumors started about how she has health problems and no one knows the truth. And the MC has taken an interest in her as more mysteries piled up. Cutting to mid-July, the two finally crossed paths. Popo is walking into the infirmary to ditch class, but someone screams. He looks and sees a half-naked Takagi and immediately gets flustered, thinking he saw everything, but instead of looking at her figure, there's something else that caught his eye, this being a pacemaker in her chest. It cuts to some time later, and this Kokuhaku disease is brought up. It then shows the two on the roof talking about this disease and how a celebrity died because of it. Takagi says that a weak heart makes this irregular heartbeat. This disease is in the same category as cardiomyopathy, and it happens to one in a million people. She then says that the amount of times a person's heartbeat in their lifetime is decided when they're born, but a person who has this illness has less beats than everyone else. She hands him her phone that's connected to a pacemaker in her chest. He looks and sees that she has a little over 220 million heartbeats left, which seems like a lot, but in reality, she only has six to seven years left until her heartbeats stop. The pacemaker in her chest is what supports her and reminds her of what time she has left, as her time shortens the faster her heart beats, which is why she sits out during PE and doesn't do strenuous exercise. But while he's listening to this, all he's thinking is she sure can talk and asks why she talked to him. She thought that if he knew her condition, he'd keep it a secret rather than tell others, since at her previous school the rumors became uncomfortable, and she could tell by looking at him that he wasn't a bad person who would spread those. All he could say is that she had it rough, but other than her short life, everything is normal. And in truth, she wants to get along with everyone and have fun like them. And if things keep going on like this, she would prefer to live her life out every second she has left, but she's afraid to do it since it would shorten her lifespan. And he thought the girl in front of him looked so sad talking to him. So he yells out to her, asking if those are her true feelings, and if so, he'll help her live her life to the fullest and make her heart beat like crazy. She's confused, but it cuts to the two at the sea, and it's her first time being there. Her heart's beating like crazy from excitement, but he thinks that her reaction is not what he was expecting. But he asks if this is really okay, since he did say he would help her, but if her heart gets pumping like that, if it's really the right thing. She tells him not to worry, since she was going to do this herself sooner or later, and it's a good opportunity. Besides, he's the first person to know about her disease. People normally wouldn't have done this, but he thought about her feelings, and that's why he said those words, and she thanks him. He blushes and turns, really excited that he got to see her smile while she's talking about how she doesn't know much about the outside world, and how she wasn't sure about the first thing to do, and was glad she had someone to help her with it. He smiles and is all excited to help her with anything she wants to do, but she tells him that she doesn't know his name, and so he tells her that it's Hato. Her mind goes to Pigeon, though, and it clicks that that's the reason his name is Popo. And that's how their summer holidays started. They would go on a bunch of adventures, one of those being an amusement park. And this surprised Popo, that being her personality is completely different from her appearance, where she looks gloomy at school, but really loves to talk and move around, even having a sense of humor. And she also has the best reactions, like having ice cream. He's a little taken aback from that difference, and he's the only one who knows about this side of her, which makes her happy. Each and every day, the two had so much fun together. And when the two are biking, she grabs onto him to make sure she doesn't fall, and he enters this moment of bliss before hearing her heartbeat, which reminds him, reminds him of a healthy person's lifespan and how everything is different for her. For her, even moving around while playing could cost her life. But he asks her what her parents think about their arrangement. She tells him that she explained the situation to them and they understood, and told her to do as she pleases. She's really happy, but feels a little sad. He looks down and is about to say something, but she tells him not to, and tells him not to 
say anymore. He pauses, thinking he's an idiot, before trying to play it off, instead inviting her to go to a fireworks festival in a nearby town, and tells her not to hold back, as summer has only just begun. She agrees to go, and smiles, thanking him. So it cuts to somewhere, and Popo asks her what's that thing on her head, asking if it's a guitar pick. When she was younger, she dreamt of becoming an artist, and that's the first pick she bought. She used to compose songs, write poems, and practice singing, but gave it all up, which surprised Popo. And of course he wants to listen, which she denies, saying it's not something that others should listen to, and it's the only thing she won't do. But he pauses, then says to think of it as a one-in-a-lifetime chance to feel excited, also saying that he understands she feels shy, but playing the songs you composed for others is part of youth, and she already went through the trouble of composing them, so why not take the chance to play them? She pauses and it cuts to them somewhere where she caved and he's got that Jojo-ass reaction face. She tells him that she's only doing it once and to not laugh, but he's just sitting there as she begins. And as she's singing, his face goes from excited to shocked as he thinks of something. It cuts to them at school, with him introducing three other people who play in the school's light music club, Kurandami being an important player later, and begs her to sing one more time in front of them. She doesn't know what's happening, and he tells her to just sing, which she does. In the middle of her singing, Popo is thinking about how her singing is soothing and tugs their heartstrings, and it's like a charm that draws them closer. Everyone is surprised by her singing, and he asks her to join the band as a vocalist, and to perform at the culture festival in October. They never had a vocalist, and Popo's terrible at it, and he says it's the artist Takigihatsu's first performance. She pauses and decides to join, and they marched on forward to the festival with practice sessions. They wrote music for a band version, and they practiced even if they didn't know they'd make it, but kept pushing on. Popo explained her situation with everyone who understood and supported her, which helped her relax. But that guy from before has a look in his eyes. It cuts to the two walking, talking about how the past few months felt like a dream, and she never thought she'd be practicing with other band members like this, all because he saw her changing. To change topic, he asks her to go have fun after the festival, since they haven't been able to, but she grabs his hand, saying this is exciting already, and runs off. He pauses and then gets red from either excitement or embarrassment, and it cuts to them about to perform, where she's nervous and freaking out. He says to take a breather, but her heart is racing, which he plays a little joke and says to go get some fresh air since they still have time. Kuranami tells Popo the same thing, and it shows Takagi outside where it's windy. With the wind is so strong, it knocks the pick out of her hair. She runs back to Popo to tell him the situation. She was going to use it as a good luck charm during the performance, and there's no real time since it's almost time to prep, but Popo says that he'll go search for it, and Kuranami's shocked by this. Popo says not to worry since he's not important to the performance and that he'll find it. So he begins his search, looking through the bushes around the festival while panting. It cuts back to the others, and Kuranami is handing back her pick. She's relieved, but asks where Popo is. Kuranami tells her that he won't be coming, and that he won't be on stage, and he tells her something. It cuts to Popo on the roof, and Takaki rushing to him, looking pale. She takes out her phone and shows that he only has a little over a thousand beats left. She starts asking why, and he realizes that Kuranami told her, and he tells her that he has about 15 minutes of life left. When his parents found out he had the disease, they asked for help from relatives to attach the device to him, and told him to use the remaining time however he wanted, even if they're unhappy with it. She still asks why, and he told her that if he told her, she'd hold herself back. He was surprised to hear that she had the same disease as him, and even told him how she felt, since he thought the same thing. If he were to die, he'd want to live a life full of excitement, and dyed his hair and joined the light music club when entering high school. That's why he wanted to cheer her on with all his heart, because he had so much fun in his life due to her, and he thanks her. He actually wanted to be on stage with her, but was running around. She wipes her tears and calls him an idiot, saying that she'll be with him. But he tells her that they put so much effort into today, and he'll be listening from there, and that it's exciting to sing in front of a crowd, and that he wants to hear her singing. It cuts to the auditorium, and Kuranami sees that she's back, saying it's time for them to go. They go on stage, and the audience is surprised to see Tagaki there with them. But she begins to sing, and sings her heart out as it cuts back to Popo, thinking he should have kissed her. He left the world at age 17, and left with the face of an idiot. Afterwards, we learn that Tagaki debuted as a songwriter after high school, and became a hot topic, becoming well-known basically overnight. She announced her illness to everyone, and sang songs that gave courage to others. She kept singing in the next few years with all her heart and soul, and over 40,000 people came to her last concert, with her parents taking care of her until her last breath. She died at age 21, and her face was that of someone who was satisfied. And that ends the chapter. The manga doesn't end there, but the other chapters are actually terrible to be considered sequels to this, but this chapter is actually amazing. It really hits you in the feels throughout the entire 
everything, reminding you that these characters aren't going to be there anymore by the time it ends. And the mangaka knew this, making these characters so easy to get attached to and takes it away like, what the f- Fuck, man. If you're looking to feel sad and listen to, I, I don't know, unravel for the next few hours, read this. What if you're the average six foot person going about your daily life in school, hating your head on objects and such, but end up saving this library assistant from falling and end up spending more and more time with her, even if she's four foot 11, and you end up falling for her? Well, that's the story of the dojin I have for you today. Let's talk 240044, called Walking Side by Side. It's from the artist Gumata. Like I said before, it's got a tall guy tag and is pretty wholesome even if it's a short read just like you so let's get right into it the dojin starts out with someone walking to a library and hitting his head on the top of the doorway Takechi, the guy kneels in pain and this old guy asks if he's okay the old guy starts apologizing for it since he asked Takechi to help and all but Takechi plays it off saying he just wasn't paying attention the old guy tells him to put what he's carrying on a table and leave the rest to the committee members but he sees someone out of the corner of his eye he sees this girl climb a step so and struggle to put a book back to the point where she loses her balance and falls but she gets caught by someone which of course is Takechi who sighs saying that was close though shortly after realizes the situation and freaks out asking if she's all right she says yes and thanks him by name he's shocked by this and then asks how she knows his name which it's pretty obvious since he tends to really stand out but they patch that up and Takechi starts helping with putting books away the girl tells him that he doesn't need to do this for her since it's her job as a committee member but he tells her that he had nothing else to do and she wouldn't want to take another spill and hurt herself right and there's that right person for the right job phrase and all since he had a tough time putting books on lower shelves so if they work together it'll be more efficient and then tries to brush the whole thing off as him being too big for his own good but she just laughs and says that he's kind and then he tries to brush that off too and it cuts to i guess school ending and she's back in the library and looming over her is of course Takechi, saying he was just passing by and thought something she blushes and it goes to this montage shot of the two talking and working together it then goes to the two again and Takechi is asking Shimura the girl about a book she recommended a while ago and how it was great because he didn't think he would have read a romance novel if it wasn't for her but he hears something that being these three girls making fun of the two and their heights he looks down at Shimura and sees that she's pretty gloomy and he doesn't know what to say to her it cuts to later and Shimura's telling him that he doesn't need to help her anymore he's confused but she goes on saying that she shouldn't take advantage of his kindness any more than this and if he's seen with with her he'll suffer needlessly he tells her that he's used to people making fun of his height and understands if she doesn't like it but to not feel bad for his sake she pauses before saying that people talk about her height too not all bad with her friend saying it makes her cuter but due to her small frame people treat her like a child and that must be why he looked after her for so long since no matter what she doesn't want him to think of her as a child he blushes and starts talking saying that ever since they first met he never thought of her as a child but far from it and thinks her honest responsible side makes her a lovely young lady and that's why he would like to cliffhanger but we see that shimura is crying and turns to ask him to give her proof that what he's saying is true he's confused but sees that she's blushing and goes to kiss her but during this kiss she ends up falling on him and hugs him saying that she's really not a child and they i don't have a short person joke for this they finish up and the two are about to walk home but it's still raining he forgot his umbrella and she offers to share hers but this is just a goofy scene and he realizes this saying that she'll get wet this way but she says a little rain won't hurt and he blushes and the dojo ends with the two walking off overall i rate this an 8.5 out of 10 the art style was amazing and the characters were engaging to see interact with each other the one thing dragging the score down though is how they constantly bring up heights and all that i know it's the main gimmick but i didn't have enough short people jokes for it besides that though it's a pretty wholesome read i recommend you check it out for yourselves as always what if right you're a guy who's trying his hardest to get with the popular senior in your group but when you propose the two of you go camping you immediately get shut down so to cheer you up, Agiaru who saw that ordeal says she'll keep you company. And one thing leads to another and you end up at her place. Well, that's the story of the sauce I have for you today. Let's talk 463144 called Drunk With Love. It's from the artist Buddha. Like I said, it's Agiaru sauce. So let's get right into it. The dojin starts out with some people drinking and this guy is trying to impress the girl sitting next to him talking about how she's into camping. We get some context on her about how she's popular and he's lucky to be sitting by her. But she starts talking about how she's 
she's seen some videos about camping food looking delicious but speaking from experience it's just not true he starts bragging how he can make literally anything like pizza or ramen which piques her interest so he invites her to go camping which she's just completely blunt and says no since she'd rather be sleeping in her bed he starts sulking while she gets called over but he saw that coming but someone walks up asking what's happening and startles him and we see this gyaru atagawa asking if he's feeling down he hopes she didn't see that but i mean of course she did she then kind of makes fun of uno the guy about getting shut down by the girl before he says it's nothing like that and she never pays attention to him anyway she tells him not to sulk and wants to go back to what he was talking about earlier if he's up for it she wants to go camping with him but he didn't hear that because he let out a noise of satisfaction after taking a drink she's kind of stun locked and he's still not paying attention asking her to drink some more and she's welcome to join him she takes a big gulp saying that she'll keep him company so they keep drinking and he drank so much that he needed help getting into a taxi going to some address and it cuts to outside of a place and he's waking up he's having thoughts like why is he on a futon how he doesn't remember anything since he drank too much and all that doesn't matter since it's a holiday so he tries to go back to sleep until he sees Atagawa right there in front of him and telling him good morning he stutters a bit before realizing and falling off the bed looking around he sees he's not at his home and is instead at her place and also sees that he's living that one no mas pantalona is progressive commercial and he also sees some condoms which makes sense why he would freak out about it she does this coy act saying that he's the one that said they should use them and he freaks out even more but she tells him that she was just joking and they haven't done anything yet with that being the key word besides she was the one that invited him over since she thought it was now or never if he picks up what she's putting down and she tells him straight up that she loves him the two are silent for a bit before she says to say something and that she knows she's kind of springing out of nowhere with that but she wants him to finally lay eyes on her he's of course lost but sees that her ears are red and she's shaking it's the first time he's seen her like that since she's always been more laid back she asks if he's more into girls like the one from before but he thinks she's so cute and realizes that he said that without thinking and she really wants to hear him say that again he caves to the pressure and wants to be let go of but instead she grabs his shirt and pulls him in for a kiss he doesn't think she's serious about it still but i mean of course she is even putting her chest on him so he can feel her heartbeat and then points out the blood flow he has and says that she wants to cross that line she wants him to know her better and says she knows she can get him to fall for her and so they get to know each other better they finish up and uno tells her that they completely mess up the order because he has an idea his idea is that they should go camping together next time she pauses before getting all excited about it like really excited when he's smiling it cuts to later and the two are camping and he finds out that she's a complete boozer and the dojin ends overall i rate this a 10 out of 10 it's a complete masterpiece and everything about it is amazing the story the artwork the characters everything Thing about it is good it's another one of buto's amazing works really bringing the best to the table i recommend you check it out for yourselves as always what if right you're a worker who just got chewed out by your boss and made fun of by your co-workers but as you travel home you see this one street performer that you always stop to hear and after learning that the performance you heard will be her last one before she moves she recognizes you and wants to go out drinking well that's the story of the dungeon i have for you today let's talk 356197 called sing to tomorrow it's from the artist kumano toru there's not a lot of tags for this one and it's pretty short so let's get right into it the dojo starts out with someone walking complaining about how he got yelled at and made fun of by his boss and co-workers but he notices something as he's leaving the station he walks over thinking that she's here today and we see this musician playing the guitar he watches her performance thinking to himself about how her singing is always nice still thinking to himself he thinks about how warming it is for him and helps him regain confidence as well as saving him more than once but he notices something is a bit different today nothing to do with her tuning but it seems like there's a trace of sadness in her singing she finishes her performance and he's clapping still thinking but this time about how he might be overthinking and then proceeds to overthink how much encouragement to give her while he's thinking that he gets called the musician calls for him and thanks him for always watching her perform and that there's something she needs to tell him he's a little shocked but is even more shocked when he learns that will be the last performance she gives there and she wanted to talk to him beforehand which just completely rocks his world and he asks rather screams why she found a job which she has to move for and won't have time to continue singing like that he says i see but on the inside is crying about not hearing her sing anymore and how he didn't think the day could get any worse but he shakes it off saying that her 
finding a job is a good thing and should be celebrated. So he hands her a fat wad of cash and says to take it for congratulations on finding a job. She's insisting that it's too much and to just say congratulations. But he goes on to say that her singing always gave him confidence when he was down. And this is the only way he can repay her. She hesitates for a bit before asking him to invite her out for drinks, which he's happy to do. So it cuts to them at a bar where he's completely wasted, asking if she's actually going to give up singing. She isn't wasted and tells him yes, since she won't have time left after work. The guy, still wasted, goes on saying that he was hoping that Tomoe, the girl, would go on to be famous and looked forward to when everyone could hear her sing. She brushes off Mizuno, the guy's, comments, saying that he's the only one who praised her like that. But it's not like she hasn't thought of that before, since she likes the feeling of people stopping to hear her music as they walk by. So she thought it was time for her to give up. He thinks to himself that this is how it is, reassuring himself that she made it after careful consideration and it's not his place to intervene. However, he tells her that he hopes she remembers there will always be someone in the world who loves her singing. She says she's glad to hear that and he says that he turned out pretty pessimistic for congratulating her and if there's anything that she wants to do since they're out drinking. She says she has somewhere in mind and yeah it's a hotel. I mean he did say he would accompany her to do anything so she wanted to make an unforgettable memory and they finish up and it cuts to a sunny day. Mizuno is out complaining about work again but gets a little notification on his phone. He checks it to see text from Tomoe about how her playing last night was a success and he should hear her sing again. He smiles at his phone and gets all hyped, in his mind of course, about working just as hard as well. And the dojin ends. Overall, it rates us a 9.9 .9 out of 10. It's so close to being a masterpiece. The one thing that drags this score down is the guy thinks to himself way too much. This guy's a thinker, that's for sure. He's got brains and he, their gaze are turning up there, unlike some people. Besides that, the art style and story was really intriguing and the characters were fun. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. And what if, right, you're living with a childhood friend of yours who just so happens to be of the opposite sex, but when she's making plans, you just so happen to be watching some adult stuff. And yeah, that's that's really all the setup for this. Let's talk 462000 called Childhood Friends. It's from the artist Yoma Konbu. Like I said earlier, it's a childhood friend sauce, so let's get right into it. The Dojin starts out with the main girl making plans, or rather refusing them, to go to work. But she overhears some weird noises coming from the other room. The person that she's on the phone with though starts making fun of her for being around Matsushita, the main guy. But as she's trying to tell her off, there's some more of those noises, and she snaps. She snaps so bad that she barges into his room, yelling at him to at least close his window. He's caught off guard and starts yelling at her to get out, but she tells him that she could hear it all the way from her room. He's confused on what she heard, but notices as she starts teasing him for being into that kind of stuff. She's saying stuff like, what's the big deal, and it's his fault for blasting it on full volume. But she also realizes that he's got a bit of action, especially taking note of the size. He tells her to get out if she's done, but she offers to take care of it for him. He's, of course, thrown off by this as she tells him why she's saying that, but he's just yelling at her to get out. He then goes on to ask when she turned into that much of a person and that she used to be a lot cuter when she was younger, which is just not the best phrase to say. She's still taunting him about it, but he says that unlike her, he's not gonna do it with just anyone. And she's still taunting him, but he says he's not a virgin because of something in freshman year, but she didn't know this about him. But she asks if that means he's single, which yeah, he is. So she says it's no big deal and gives him the same offer and this time he takes it. But in the middle of this, there's backstory. Going back to their middle school days, Shizuku, the main girl, is talking to some girl about how things are going with Matsushita and if he asked her out already, which of course he didn't. So the girl says that she should do it because the girl just can't stand watching them and they're graduating next week so might as well. Though they're going to the same school and she doesn't want to risk their relationship. This girl then says that if she keeps up that talk, some other girl will snatch him up before she knows it. The flashback then cuts to the two walking and talking, how everyone's going their separate ways but they're stuck together. Matsushita tells her to tell him if she manages to get a boyfriend since he's like her big brother. But she gives this kind of look 
before smiling, saying that he's obviously the little brother. It cuts back to them doing it, but also confessing their feelings for each other. They finish up, and he asks if she wants to date, which is kind of dumb to ask right after they do it, but it might be a little late for that with their history. But she smiles and says, of course it isn't, and the dungeon ends. Overall, I rate this a 9 out of 10. The story was pretty good, and the artwork was amazing. However, it is incredibly horny, which I, I don't know why I'm saying this with the history of this channel, but it's good nonetheless. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. What if, right? One night you're walking the streets alone after getting scolded by your boss, but on this night you end up seeing some girl struggling to get away from a guy. And even though you try to ignore it, fate had other plans and you end up saving her and taking her back to your place. But your place is an actual garbage dump. And after she learns something about you, offers to stay with you for a while. Well, that's the story of the dojin I have for you today. Let's Let's talk 460261 called Crane's Return of a Favor. It's from the artist Moki. There's not a lot of tags for this one, but let's get right into it. The dungeon starts out with someone walking around the streets thinking to himself about things like his terrible performance at work and how it's his fault since there's no way it's society's. But while he's thinking about how joyless life is, he sees someone grabbing hold of this girl and takes back what he thought about society. Though he chooses to ignore it, fate had a different idea as he trips on a can landing right in the middle of the two. He's on the floor but gets picked up by the guy who's yelling at him to get out of the way but he's more concerned about her asking if she's okay. She grabs onto him saying he's kind for worrying about her and that she was waiting for him even going so far as calling him darling. This guy is understandably flabbergasted and immediately disoriented when she throws her jacket at him as the two run away. They run for a bit and end up hiding somewhere. He turns to her and says thanks for saving him and he'll repay her for the jacket but that's her line. She says that she'll repay him for saving her, and they end up going to his place, which is just a complete mess. He starts cleaning up, thinking about how he brought back a girl to this garbage dump, but now that he sees her in the light, he thinks she's really cute. She looks down at him, sweating on the floor, and asks to use his bath, offering to wash his back for him. And so yeah, she does. But during this scene, we learn something. Ben, the main guy, can't get extra blood flow down there, possibly due to stress from the company he works and so Chizuru, the main girl, offers to stay for a while. And then it goes to this montage of her taking care of the place and him, and also seeing that his work has improved, surpassing those of his colleagues. The montage ends and we see Ben coming home to her cooking dinner. He says he's taking the day off tomorrow, and she asks what he's gonna do. Though he responds with the same question for her. She says that she wants to be with Ben, and that's when he gets a little blood flow down there. He covers and she asks what's wrong. But when he tells her that he's excited, she he turns off the stove saying it's time and they just start doing it right then and there though they finish up and ben starts thinking back about repaying and how they weren't really dating or anything so when that's over what's going to happen to her it cuts to him waking up in bed but sees that she isn't next to him like before and he starts sobbing but she leans out from the bathroom and asks why he's crying he looks over and gets up to hug her happy that she's still there he then confesses her feelings for her and the dojin ends with him offering to repay her overall i rate this a nine out of 10. It is just so good. It's just a very wholesome read and everything with it. The art style is amazing, the story is amazing, and the characters are amazing. The one thing is even though the story is amazing, there's not a lot of it, but that's about it. And what if, right, one of your co-workers just seems extremely unapproachable. Like the air around them seems impregnable to be able to go up and talk to them. So you, being the goody two-shoes you are, try your best to help her become more social and have a more accepting aura. But after you both walk around town for a bit, you start realizing that she's not really this gloomy shell of a human, just antisocial. Well, do I have a sauce for you then? <laughs> Let's talk 371555, called Slipping Mask. It's from the artist Fushoku. It doesn't really have a lot of tags, but let's get right into it. The story starts out at a cafe, with someone handing something to the main guy, Okigami. He takes this something and walks into the other room, calling out to the girl there, Himuro who looks a little gloomy. Okigami tells her that some co-workers brought back gifts from their trip and to pick something that suits her fancy. She tells him that she'll look at it later since she's busy at the moment and to just leave it there. He goes back into the other room where the other girl is apologizing for making him do that. He said it's fine, but why did he have to ask?
ask her. She goes on saying that it's just that Himuro has a weird, impregnable aura about her, and she seems fussy. And since the two of them worked together, she thought they were on good terms. He says that they do get into some small talk here and there, but he wouldn't really say they're on good terms. Though this girl starts to get all coy, saying that she happened to overhear that they arranged an evening meetup, and that may very well be a secret relationship. But he wishes that was the case. Because of the two at dinner or some restaurant, sitting across from each other at the table, he tries to get straight to the point, asking what this was all for, but she says to eat up since it can wait. He digs in and she starts talking to him about how he can get along with everyone. He thinks it's really nothing to fuss over, and it's normal to be that way. She wants to do the same though, but thinks it's a bridge she can't cross or she's too cold to do so. She doesn't keep with the trends and can't talk to other girls, but that's why she's taking conversation lessons. This excites him, asking who's teaching her, but when she points at him, he seems a little less excited. He says that she can't learn how to talk to people just from him explaining, so she suggests they go for a stroll and get practice. They have the rest of the day off, so why not? And they go for a stroll, and he's completely beat and doesn't know what to say. But to ease the tension, he asks what she does on her days off. She thinks about it for a minute before responding with not really an answer. She then apologizes, saying she's supposed to elaborate on it, but instead goes on saying that she gets nervous when she has to give a serious answer and then overthinks things. He's just completely gone at this point, but says to ease into it little by little. They go into an arcade, and she walks around a bit reminiscing while he goes to get drinks. She stops at this game where there's this little keychain thing, but suppresses her want for it. He comes back though and sees her, asking if she wants that. She plays it off saying she doesn't care, which of course he's skeptical. So he gets the prize and hands it to her, saying it's hers. She says thank you, and he blushes saying that she'll be fine just the way she is. She doesn't need to worry about how to talk to people or dressing up because she's pretty alright as is. Though he sounds pretty patronizing and apologizes, she then says that she thought he was a shallow guy and he says he thought she was a gloomy spoil sport so everything works out in the end. She smiles and says I guess and they spend some more time in the arcade before cutting to them about to end the night and go their separate ways. But she says wait, grabbing his arm and asks to stay together for a little longer. And uh, yeah. They finish up and it cuts to the cafe again where Okigami is just walking in. Though he sees that it's pretty busy and asks that one co-worker from before what happened. She tells him that it seems Himuro is quite the social butterfly if he knew that. But he looks and smiles at her and the dojin ends with her smiling back holding up a peace sign. Overall, I rate this an 8.5 out of 10. The dojin was really good, don't get me wrong, as well as the art style. The one thing that dragged the score down incredibly is the translation. In this video, I translated it to modern English, but in this actual dojin, it seems to be written in old English. But besides that, it's pretty good, and I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. Okay, so I don't really, I, I don't have a fancy setup for this video. <laughs> Normally for these sauce videos, I do, and be like, okay, so basically imagine this happened, and then that's like the sauce. I don't have one of those. But hear me out on this. Childhood friends, <laughs> plus kimono, <laughs> plus amazing artwork. <laughs> I mean, what other story do you scroll into the comments and see people saying, Bro, I didn't fap at it. I was impressed by the art. This story is good enough to have its own animated adaptation called Kimigasuki. I also just realized this. It's got an 8.7 on IMDb. Now, what is this story I've been alluding to? Let's talk 258133 called Summer and Innocence. It's from the artist Jorori. Like I said earlier, it has everything you could ever need. Childhood friends friends, kimonos, extravagant artwork, so let's get right into it. The story starts out with two people on a bike, talking about how hot the summer is going to be and about prep school, but they switch topics to fireworks and a firework display that's happening that night. The guy then says that it was way too crowded last year, which she invites him over to hers to watch them. He thinks about it for a little, but she hugs him, saying not to be so gloomy and to let off some steam. He finishes up his drink and says fine. She gets all excited about about it and tells him that he'll be surprised by her yukata, which she probably shouldn't tell him about that now. But anyway, it cuts 
to a festival before cutting to someone ringing a doorbell. Inside, we see the girl in her yukata, but the guy is focused on how crowded it was outside. She tries asking him what he thinks, but he's not really paying attention to her, which gets her thinking and starts pushing him upstairs. She looks out her window, seeing a lot of people while he's just eating on his phone. Then she steals one of his takoyaki, which is extremely uncalled for. He then grabs her arm and starts making fun of how soft her arms are, which then takes us to him just tickling her. But the fireworks start, and they both look out the window. He starts commenting on it, about how they're a lot closer than he thought, but he sees something. He sees her completely infatuated with the fireworks over these two pages. She looks over at him smiling, and he turns blushing. And they kiss, and she says that her parents aren't going to be home that night. And with that kind of setup, you already know what happens next. They finish up and end off the night holding hands, smiling as the fireworks end. They're both outside now, talking about how they didn't really get to see the fireworks, and messing with the sparkler. But she finds another sparkler that someone dropped, and is eager to light it. The guy says under his breath that he's happy he went by, which she didn't hear. So he says that he's going to take a photo of her, and then of course takes a photo. And the story ends with him setting the photo he took as his wallpaper. Overall, I rate this a 9.9 .9 out of 10. The only thing that's really dragging the score down is how short it is, and it could probably see some benefits for being longer. The story though was pretty good. It did jump at points and didn't really make sense, but that's nitpicking. And don't even get me started on the art style. Oh my god. God. The art style is way too good to be a sauce. If I were to compare it as like the sauce version of an actual manga, I'd say that this artist is like the Kentaro Mira of sauce. What I'm trying to say is do yourself a favor and check out this artist and their other works. And that's so what if you're just a lonely bartender working at a not so well-known bar on the outskirts of a town, but one day a random fox girl shows up begging to work for you and seeing how adamant she is about it, you say, sure and all of a sudden your once desolate bar becomes packed with people all because this girl is good with customers and has way too much energy too much energy to be expended on pranks that she pulls on you which ultimately leads to one of the few reasons your bar is popular well that's the story of the sauce i have for you today and this one doesn't have any numbers attached to it let's talk con con caprice this dozen is from the artist mr e and no not the scooby-doo character and according to the sauce bible it's got tags like childhood friends hand holding and of course fox girl so let's get right into it the sauce starts out with an outside shot of a bar and people laughing cutting inside we see people drinking and asking the main guy leo for more booze leo then asks someone to take care of it which is when two animal like ears twitch and a cheery fox girl says right away she goes around serving drinks and taking orders there's then some inner dialogue from leo where he's talking about her her name is Aino, and it's not a fox cosplay she claims to be from a far island which he had no idea people like her existed but since she started working there the bar became more popular, which is a good thing, and he's never had to deal with that many clients. The place used to be a rat's nest until she arrived, and she has so much energy that at times, it's hard for him to keep up with her pace. Some days, he just wants to forget everything and rest, but there's a problem with that as well. As some customers point out, he gets a new tattoo when that happens, because she uses so much of her energy pulling pranks on him. It wasn't bad at first, but as time passed, it got a bit heavier handed, to the point where she would fill up a mop bucket with some paint and make the floor look straight out of a CSI episode, and then clients started to join her. It became so prevalent that most of the clients that turn up just wanted to see a fox girl pull pranks on the owner of the bar. It's not what he expected when he opened the bar, but at least he's getting that bank. He's understandably upset, but sees her and just says to continue working. But now there's some guys who are ogling her and her tail. And later that night, as the bar is slowly losing its crowd, three guys are still there talking about the crimes they've committed, but they call her over, saying that they made a bet and wanted to ask something. This something being if the tail is a plug and trying to sneak a peek to settle the issue. She brushes it off, telling them to go home since they're drunk, but one of them grabs her tail. Leo sees this and sees that they're getting pretty handsy with her, to the point where they're picking her up and taking her to the bathroom. But before they could get far from the table, they get a big old sock to the face, sending him flying back to the table. Leo tells them thanks for their patronage and to pay up and leave. The three guys then try to pick a fight, and for that cartoon effect, it cuts to the outside of the bar with a bunch of onomatopoeias before cutting back to two guys beaten up. Leo threatens them, telling them that's what they get for bothering Ayano and for them to give
get out and never come back. But the third guy takes a wine bottle and smashes it over Leo's head. And instead of reacting like anyone would in pain, Leo turns his eyes back with the wine running over his head, scolding the guy about how expensive that wine was. Then comes Ayano with the tray and whacks him on the head. It cuts to later when the police are there to take them away and about how much trouble they cause in other bars and starting fights. The police officer then asks if Leo should go to the doctor and he says he's fine and he'll get back to work. Ayano whacks his head now, telling him to not be a tough guy and to swallow his pride, but Ayano whacked him a bit too hard and he face planted and he goes to take a nap. It's flashback time now with Leo asking why it feels familiar. It then shows a marker and a paw leaving some marks on this person's back. Leo's thinking about the fox he adopted as a kid and how they used to cause so much trouble back then and sometimes they would cross the line like the day the fox got into trouble with some guys at a factory and Leo took the beating for her and then thinks about how she just vanished one night but that's pretty much all for the flashback because he wakes up now with Ayano by his side. He asks why she's there which she reminds him of the fight and the guys. Leo remembers saying that her pranks are getting a bit overboard which she then asks if he thinks she'll get herself harassed just to play a joke and I don't really blame him for being skeptical but it wasn't the case. Again you can't really blame him for being paranoid over all the pranks and she admits that she can go a bit overboard at times and even says that if he wants them to stop but before she can finish that thought he grabs her cheeks and gets all close like really close and then just screams that he's dying in her face and then laughs at her face. She goes to run off but he grabs her arm and puts her on the bed saying it's just a prank and they kiss with him thinking that this is probably why he bears with her pranks. What else do you expect when they work and live in the same place? They start doing it but there's some more backstory. He wasn't looking for employees when she arrived but she was so insistent that he ended up hiring her and someone like her could have gotten a job anywhere but she chose there. He was terrible with dealing with girls and one day he asked something stupid out of nerves. This being if her tail is glued to the dress or a plug and instead of being the crap out of him she just goes all coy saying wanna find out and that's one hell of a way to break the ice which is around the same time the prank started. That doesn't really matter though because it cuts back to them doing it. They finish up and he asks why she wanted to work there. Since it's not a fancy restaurant or a cafe in the city she smiles and says that being around him could be a lot of fun and the dojin ends with a shot of the two fishing while they were still young. Overall I rate this a 10 out of 10. The art style is amazing even with it being in full color. The characters were fun and interesting as well. The story and how both the plots of the past and present intertwined was really good as well. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. Let me put an image in your head really quick. You're a violinist, someone who's worked tirelessly to put on a show with your violin. However, you have this one friend who supports you in your violin career through and through. The only problem is your friend has never seen your face, and not because you cover it or anything, but because they're blind. Despite this though, they still support you when you play for them. And now you may be asking why I'm bringing this up, and those of you who come back to this channel frequently know the answer already. That is, of course, because it's the story of the dojin I have for you today. Let's talk 383538 called A Yearning Rondo. It's from the artist Betty. It's got a blind tag and I'm ready to have my heart broken. So let's get right into it. The dojin starts out at a shrine with someone reading a book in braille. Two people then enter, one of them announcing that a kyoya has come to visit this girl who gets all excited at the visitor. The two catch up talking about how they haven't met in a while and how he's getting coached in something. This something being for the violin he plays which he has on him. She hasn't heard him play in a while and wants to hear him perform, which he says is a piece of cake and she gets excited again. And so he performs for her and cuts to the ending of it with her clapping, asking about whether the song was difficult to play. He's kind of thrown off by this because he didn't expect her to ask about that, asking if there was anything wrong. She might be overthinking it, but it's that she felt he sounded different than usual. She then asks if something happened and it's not really that something did happen. He's just scared. scared of a competition in two weeks about how him being stressed will affect his performance and whether he'll be able to play in front of everyone and not mess up disappointing people he knows he keeps asking himself these questions and that scares him she calls him then saying that she loves him he processes it for a moment before realizing what she just said and asks why she said that so suddenly she was shocked when she first heard him play because she didn't know that someone could draw out such emotion from others through music but at the same time she felt that the sounds he made were sad. This has been on her mind the entire time they've known each other, but she thinks she finally has the answer to it. She calls him over to lend her his hand, which she grabs and tells him that she will always believe in him and that everything will be fine. Kyoya then takes this moment to confess his feelings for her as well. She also takes a moment to process before realizing what he said, which she's glad about. But on 
unlike her, he travels a lot and knows a lot of people. So she was sure that he was in love with someone else. I also want to point out this note here saying that he doesn't have any friends, just because why not? She then asks him about what he likes about her, and he stutters a bit before posing the same question back to her. She tells him that she likes how he drops by occasionally to visit, how he puts his all into the violin, and she really loves and respects him. But there's one more thing, which is his smell. Well, she loves his violin skills, which she can smell him like that, it tells her that he's right in front of her, which she loves knowing. She tells him that it's his turn now, but he just kisses her. But she doesn't know that, because she can't see. And asks why he just touched her lips. Which she goes on saying there wasn't anything on them, but actually that he just kissed her. Which she, again, takes a minute to process before reacting. But after sulking for a bit, she then asks if he can kiss her again, saying that she thought he knew him well by now, but when they talked, she realized she didn't know a lot of things. And that kiss was something she'd never felt before and made her happy. And she wants to know more, or rather, everything. They kiss again, this time throwing a little bit of extra spice into it, and then they just go straight to doing it. They finish up, and she says that it makes her feel so glad they met when they become one like that. But he goes into his thoughts, thinking that's his line because he didn't want to start playing violin at all. That's right. It's flashback time. He was born into a family of musicians and absolutely hated playing the violin. His family would get mad if he made a mistake or didn't play the piece well, and he started to feel jealous of other kids because they got to do what they wanted. And with all those adults and audiences watching him, none of them noticed his feelings. But she was the only one who tried to understand him, or already understood what he truly felt. It cuts to them before cutting to a stadium or a theater, with Kilya getting ready. But someone calls his name, Binica. The two talk for a bit about how she was looking forward to it and something else but she doesn't tell him any further than that the two share and everything will be fine before he goes on stage finally realizing that he doesn't have to care about others and to play his own performance and that's why he can be himself from then on and everything will surely be fine and the dungeon ends overall i rate this an 11 out of 10 the story was absolutely immaculate with the art style pairing with it really well the characters were fun and entertaining throughout the entire story and really made you want to learn more about them that flashback sequence after the deed was a bit out of the blue but was necessary and probably the best time to throw it in but besides that it was good i recommend you check it out for yourselves as always what if your angel-like senpai has a secret she can tell no one a secret that would definitely get her made fun of in school but while getting drunk one night with her she shows you the secret the secret being that she has a split tongue which yeah i don't know about that but to each his own but that's the story of this dojin i have for you today let's talk to 286444. And shout out to Cow Scout Gaming on TikTok for sponsoring this video and helping me with refinding this sauce called Miramata Son's Secret 1 through 3. It's from the artist Igumox. With a body modification tag, it's bound to be weird. So let's get right into it. The dojo starts out with someone yelling about work and our two protagonists bowing and apologizing. The girl says that she'll take full responsibility, but who I'm guessing is their boss says that he doesn't care and to get back to work. And they both excuse themselves. While walking out, the guy starts apologizing to Miramata, the girl, about troubling her with his mistake, but her mind is elsewhere. It's on how the boss was clenching his hand in pain after that smash. The two are walking and laughing while he starts thinking about how good of a senpai she is, cheering him up with her smile every time he gets chewed out by his boss and making work actually fun. But she always covers her mouth when she laughs. It cuts to later when they're standing outside a closed bar, so he says that they should just go somewhere else, which gives her the idea to drink at her place and he gets all excited about that. It cuts again to when they're at her house, drinking and having a good time. She's saying some things about how he's reflecting on his mistakes and giving his best, and how she believes in him, which is good and all, but makes Kaji fold. And then she goes on saying something, but he's distracted by that split tongue. He then, of course, asks about it because he saw it plain as day. She got careless when she's at home, and it's the reason she's always covering her mouth when she laughs. She apologizes for showing him that, saying it must be off-putting. He said he's not really put off, but why that of all things? She goes on to explain that it was part of her youth and she liked it, but people detested her even at the slightest glimpse of it. He's thinking about how she's being so meek and such, then asks if she can move both sides independently. And I'm gonna give you a warning right now, this next second is gonna be kinda gross, so here we go. 
Now that that's over, no matter how gross it could be, Kaji finds it hot and thinks it would be great to kiss with her. And she leans over to offer one and also offers to pop his cherry. And so the cherry bursts and it cuts to them waking up panicking. But panic over, she asks if he wants to bathe together and gets made fun of for it. And this ends the first part of the story. The second part of the story begins with them at their office talking about work and making plans for something. But Kaji's in the background, thinking about her tongue and gets called as he frantically answers. He thinks it's totally showing on his face and she calls him over again, this time asking if his birthday is the day after tomorrow, which it is, and he's shocked she remembered, but is more shocked by her just straight up licking his ear. He jumps back and she starts taunting him, with him getting himself together afterward. Or so he thought as it cuts to a bar setting. He kept glancing at her, thinking it was completely obvious and about how she can keep natural. He thinks he's the only one serious about the relationship, but was never talked about if they were going out and they're adults so they don't really talk about this stuff and he's just completely lost. It cuts to them at karaoke now talking about what they sing and she apparently sings something bad enough to make him jump back. She then tells him, not asks, that they should go to a hotel because she wants to have a good time and she gives him an early birthday present and it goes to them at their office again with him trying to keep his composure and she retreats to the restroom. She then splashes water in her face and loses her composure a lot before getting it back together to end off the second part. The third and final part begins with them at their office again, this time dismissing a sick person from there to go rest. Miramata then dismisses everyone else, going to work in a dark room and realizing it's more than she thought and stressing about what's to come afterward. But she didn't realize someone was calling her. Kaji, who's there to help her and yell at her to let him spoil her, getting her some ramen, chocolates, and some other things, and making it really difficult for her. Because out of everyone in the company, she's the one he respects most, but also her boyfriend. She gets all embarrassed and asks him for a hug before cutting to them on the casting couch hugging. Kaji tells her that she's more than just cool, and to not bear everything herself and rely on him as well. She has some flashbacks, both about work and her tongue, but since sees this frame from before. She then breaks down crying and asks to go to the restroom, but he denies that, reminding her that he will spoil her with every fiber of his body. And she breaks down crying again, this time on him. She then thanks him and he says it's not just him, but everyone loves her and they should go home after they wrap up with work. But she doesn't wanna. She wants to be spoiled some more with hugs and head pats and a kiss and they do it at work. They finish up and it cuts to them leaving, talking about how much work they have done. He's glad he gets to know different Muramata than everyone else, but she bets she'll reveal plenty more faces. He then says that he'll love her no matter what face she shows and they kiss on the sidewalk, but he asks what's the reason for the split tongue, cause apparently that wasn't brought up till just now, but she sticks it out and says it's a secret, and the dungeon ends with some more of their shenanigans. Overall, I rate this a 9.9 .9 out of 10. The story and art style are amazing and all. The one thing dragging this down though is that one frame where I only showed a second of it. Besides though, it's a pretty good read and I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. Big thanks once again again to Cav Scout Gaming on TikTok for sponsoring this video. I have a little fun fact for you. You've probably already met your future partner, the one who you'd be in a relationship with, and I guess good for you. <laughs> but you may be curious why I'm bringing this up. Well, of course, it's related to this dojin I'm reviewing today. Let's talk 417221, called Beyond the Unfulfilled Future. It's from the artist Tomobi, who's done a few other sauces I've done on this channel, like 42951. For. With not a lot of tags to go off of, I can't really judge what I'm getting myself into. So let's get right into it. The story starts out with giving us some context about two people, that being the guy and girl pictured here. The girl asks how long he's going to keep up with that because there's hardly anyone left for his stage, and even his band members are looking for jobs. So now what? But this just seems to get his attention, and probably not in the good way. She elaborates even more, saying every song he makes is boring, and that it should just become a hobby while they work actual jobs. This was the straw that broke the camel's back though, and Kyoya starts full on screaming at her about how she doesn't know a damn thing. And if she's saying this, why is she also avoiding finding a job? She says that she isn't really trying to avoid it, but he screams at her to get out of there and throws his headphones at her, saying that he isn't just doing this for fun, and says to not show her face to him again. But yeah, that was a pretty rocky breakup to start this off. Though it cuts to the future, with the title card over some office lady, with some text saying breakup, a prelude to a reunion that will come one day. She walks into this 712 to buy some things, and goes to check out, but she looks up at the cashier to see that it's her ex who recognizes her, and the two were reunion, which is bad 
bound to be awkward, with the two of them making some small talk on why she's there. They finish up the transaction, and before she goes, he asks her if she wants to talk for a bit since his shift is almost up. The two are now walking around, looking at the scenery, and reminiscing on how long it's been. He's still living in that rundown apartment, and things haven't really changed since they were dating, which she kind of seems relieved over. The two end up walking to his house, and though he proposes they go to a park, she says it's fine if they go to his room, since she doesn't have a boyfriend. They go to enter his place while she's kind of making fun of him about how much of a mess it used to be, but he walks in to turn on the light to a completely different room from what she remembers. She's, of course, thrown off by this, with the CDs and guitars going, but he's just moving. He gave up on trying to be a pro and got rid of most of his stuff, which she's kind of surprised by. But she remembers what she said before, saying it's her fault and she just had to say something like that, referring to the breakup. That didn't really have anything to do with it though, since the two other band members found jobs and the band broke up. But he still wanted to be a pro to prove her wrong, making his own demo CDs and applying for a record label. But every record label he applied to said the same thing no matter where he went, and sometimes it was worse, which is when he gave up. The more he realized his ability, he accepted that he wasn't special, but part of this ordinary crowd, aspiring to make it big, but not being part of the small few who do. Once he realized that, the stress from it was gone, and if he kept dwelling on it, he could never move forward. He maybe just completely gave up. Psych! If he gave up, he would've never landed a job with a record label! It's not a very well-known one, but it's next month, which coincides with him moving out. Even though he gave up on being a pro, he didn't quit music the one thing he loves. He reaches into his closet to grab a guitar, this guitar being the guitar the two of them bought after their first live show. And come to think of it, he still owes her the 80,000 yen for it. He sold his CDs and guitars since he didn't have money for a suit, which she would have known that much after the four years they dated. And she can probably also guess, which it's completely obvious, that he wants to do it. And yeah, they just go straight to doing it. They finish up and she's getting ready to leave, because there's anime to watch and work in the morning. So he says he'll walk her to the station. She asks if she can contact him again while they're walking since he did end up blocking her number after the breakup, and he asks if she's okay now, since she initially had a very depressed look on her face. She grabs his hand and says that she was able to clear her head thanks to him, and goes on to get home. She gets home and goes on Twitter to do the impossible and delete her account that's full of her voice acting prowess, saying she'll contact the office tomorrow, since anime is something you should watch, not be in. And the dojin ends. Overall, I rate this a 9 out of 10. The art style is amazing, and and though a bit heartbreaking at first, the story is as well. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. That Imagine something really quick. Your college professor gives you a partner assignment where you actually have to socialize with your partner. But the assignment topic is having a good time in young adult relationships. And your partner also has a fear of men. But your professor kept on insisting on this assignment, bringing up some honestly valid arguments. So to just get it over with, you go with them to the library to do some research where he just doesn't know how to talk to her. And when she needs your attention, you decide the best course of action is to text her, which she just asks for you to get a book because the librarian that day was male. You hand her the book and try to get out of her view to not trigger her phobia, but she thanks you, saying she feels less scared around you, her way of overcoming her phobia. And because of that, you guys made a lot of progress on your assignment and set up a survey in your school, but she passes out trying to ask two guys questions for it. You decide to be the good guy in this scenario and say that you'll do it alone, but she says it'll be a good opportunity for her to overcome her phobia. And and has something she wants to try. So they end up in a love hotel, and in order for her to get over her fear, she wants him to be her first man to end off this first part. That's right, this is a multi-work series. The second part starts with the two handing out questionnaires and seeing that Hannah Murray is slightly getting over her fear, but that's when someone calls out to her, her classmates. Hannah Murray says that it's thanks to Kanzaki that she's able to get over her fear, but the classmates hug her saying that just because their relationship improved, she won't be handed over so easily. And during this, Kanzaki is having some sort of PTSD situation, thinking about how this seems awfully familiar. That's when we see a flashback to apparently his childhood, when three girls are scolding him for confessing his feelings to one of them. He thinks that, and thinks that this is the same situation, and he almost got in over his head. He says he'll stop bothering them and goes to sort out materials in a classroom, and denies Hanamori coming with him and getting him in the way. She's left there stunned before cutting to a classroom and Kanzaki sitting there on the computer, thinking about how he almost 
acted impulsively again. Thinking back, the only reason they had a good time was to help her get over her phobia so they could finish the project, because he was a non-scary man to her and just spent one night together. Though, Hanamari burst through the doors, which is when she calls out to him. She asks him if something was wrong, since he was acting a little strange. He says it's nothing, and doesn't have anything to do with her. But even if he says that, and even if they should be focusing on the project, it could be that something that they said made him uncomfortable. Because Kanzaki is the kind of person to never speak up for himself, and if they said something that hurt him, to accept her apology. This is when he would, of course, jump up and yell that she hasn't done anything wrong, which, of course, startles her. He sits down and apologizes for yelling loudly all of a sudden, and says that it's not really her fault, it's just that he's been in a similar situation before and was reminded of what happened. He says that it's entirely his problem and completely unrelated to her, and wanted to change subjects. But she gets all close to him and hugs him, saying that if just thinking about it can make him act like this, then it must be a really painful memory. She's thankful for that, turning that embarrassing project into a happy experience and helping her get over her phobia. It's all thanks to him. And now it's her turn to help him, saying that he can tell her anything that's bothering him. And in the end, he really does like Hanamori, maybe a little too much, because now he's remembering the good time they had and hides his extra blood flow. She then realizes what's happening and apologizes, but it's not really her fault for him reacting like that. He's now having a crisis about it, but she asks if he would like her to help with it. And so yeah, they do it at school. They took so long doing it that there's a class that's supposed to be their next period, and they rush out, thinking they did something terrible in the spur of the moment. He asks about something she said during it, but she says that he'll tell him next time. This part ends with him thinking that he knows he likes her, but doesn't know how she feels about him. And this takes us to the final part, part three of this trilogy of sauces. The sauce starts out with people at a drinking party, seeming to be everyone in that professor's class from before. The two are there, of course, and he's sitting pretty far from Hanamori. Then some guys come up and ask if they can sit by him. They're his two friends who came to join him in drinking alone in the corner. They ask why doesn't he join Hanamori, and asks if he's already done it with her, which explains why he spits out his drink. His only response to that is that they aren't dating yet, which is apparently too much based on how they reacted. They press for more info, but he backs off saying that he'll go greet Hanamori and go home. But when he looks over, he sees that a certain someone has been trying to pick up girls since he got there, and is now trying to pick up Hanamori, who doesn't know what to do in that kind of situation. He sees this and stands up to go stand behind this guy with that mob psycho 100 look. The guy tries to brush him off, but he calls for Hanamori, asking if her house is a bit far from there and that they should go since he's about to leave. She stands up and goes with him without blinking an eye as the others are saying to that guy from before that he didn't really stand a chance. Going to the Meitu outside, Kanzaki starts apologizing for the weird rumors that might be brought up because of this. Sorry for misspeaking earlier, but apologizing isn't really the right word here. It's more frantically apologizing. He says that even if she's used to talking to guys now, he still feels like she's gonna get scared and push herself, which he can't overlook. She then walks over to him and grabs him, asking how he knew. She's actually still scared of men, but it's better than before because of him. She's still nervous when there's a lot around, and the guy from before was scary. And while she was there, she couldn't help but feel she made the wrong choice. But he was as reliable as always, because whenever she's hurt or scared, he always appears to help her. And being paired with him made her really lucky. And she thanks him. The two share a hug on the sidewalk before she asks if his house is nearby. Because she wants Konzaki to take her home, quote unquote. But she grabs her hand and they go, literally zooming to his apartment. They get in and just immediately start doing it, confessing to each other in the middle of it. They finish up and it cuts to them in class, giving and finishing up their presentation. The professor gives them an applause and commends them for their work, especially Hanamori, who seems like a completely different person from the start of the assignment. It's not really due to encouragement though, but really thanks to Kanzaki. After that, the project came to a close and the class disbanded, but the two of them were now inseparable. Overall, I rate these sauces as a collective 12 out of 10. This entire trilogy is just amazing. Such a wholesome read and amazing one at that. The artist Hirio did an amazing job with the artwork and story in general. The sauces individually were pretty great as well, but when brought together really shine. I recommend you check them all out for yourselves as always. Let's talk 351814. Before we continue though, this episode of Let's Talk was sponsored by my friend Ivan. He gave me $20 for food on Wednesday at the sub shop and it was the best sub I probably ever had. Getting back to it though, called Abandoned Cat Girlfriend, it's from the artist Danimaru. Not a lot of tags to go off of for this one, but let's get right into it. The dojo starts out with a snowy overlook of a town, with someone talking about how cold it is. This someone is walking through the snow, complaining about the cold and how hungry he is, which leads to him visiting a convenience store to buy dinner, which is where he sees her. The 
her in question is picking up some bread and putting it in her school bag which she spots and rushes over to whisper at her to put it back she pauses before breaking out crying saying she's sorry he tells her that he's not trying to accuse her of anything but it's now awkward because people are looking so he says they should go outside they're outside now surprised but he hands her his handkerchief to help her calm down and clean up but she's just completely blank faced he's confused but questions her about why she was trying to shoplift and how it would cause trouble for her parents she tells him that she doesn't care about them and it has nothing to do with them it looks like she has a really rough home life and wearing so little in the middle of the night he takes his jacket and puts it around her saying it's cold out so they should go back to his place because he can sense she doesn't want to go home and it would be a pain for her to stay at the convenience store all night which they go he gives her some coffee asking her some more questions about why she was trying to shoplift she responds by saying it was to piss off her mom because when she was little she remarried and had another kid after that she was always in the way and spent her whole life being ignored by her family even that day when she went home her mother wouldn't let her in it's happened countless times and she finally realized that she doesn't care how much her mom hates her she just wants a home where she can go back to whenever she wants he offers up his place whenever she's in trouble but of course she thinks that she's got to do weird stuff in exchange for it but that's not really the case because whenever he looks at her he thinks of a poor abandoned cat she's upset by this for some reason and then does the stereotypical look down laughing to herself thing she then introduces herself as Hizuka Ryo and he introduces himself as Igarashi Shuji now that introductions are out of the way she says that she may not be a cute cat but hopes he'll take care of her and from that day on whenever Ryo couldn't go home she went to his place she still has an attitude but he gets a sense of peace of mind whenever he sees her smile Ryo's parents never took her anywhere so when they would go out he got the privilege of seeing her first reactions to a bunch of different things like conveyor belt sushi and steak sushi which is funny for him because he's only seen elementary schoolers get excited over it his once barren apartment became much livelier with Ryo around to the point where he doesn't know if it's his or hers but that's better than before and before he knew it he was doing everything he could to see that smile and one day he's coming home from a sudden business trip and hasn't been home in a bit he got home at 1 a.m in the middle of the night and at the doorstep of his apartment was Ryo shivering in the cold she sees him and jumps up to hug him because she thought he wasn't gonna come home she's freezing because she was out there the whole time yesterday and the day before her mom locked her out and she wanted to see him so they hurry inside to warm her up after a bit the two are sitting on the bed she tells them that she's sorry for panicking like that because even though he was gone for a few days she got scared her heart would stop pounding and when she couldn't open his door she couldn't help but feel like she was a nuisance and didn't want to believe that so she waited for him to come home he apologizes for not telling her that he was leaving but she grabs his face and kisses him confessing her feelings for him whenever she's with him her heart feels warm and cozy but also races because she likes him and wants to stay with him forever he feels the same way and says he loves her as well which makes her happy and they just go straight to doing it they finish up and it cuts to them at the mall shopping he's buying her a bunch of stuff like a cell phone so there won't be a repeat of last time they're still walking around and he asks her if there's anything else she wants which is when something catches her eye she drags him along and points towards it it's a wedding dress saying that she would like to try one of these on and the doesn't end overall if i could rate this higher it would be a 12 out of 10 i absolutely love this story and love the characters the art style is absolutely immaculate and incredibly adorable i recommend you check it out for yourselves as always again big thanks to ivan for that sandwich his instagram will be linked below use your imagination for this one real quick you get invited to a drinking party which you haven't really drank before but you're still somehow keeping up with this girl across from you who's your senpai and you end up completely wasted your friends who invite did you leave to go to an after party and you're stuck there with your senpai who instead of walking you home takes you to a love hotel and does it with you while you're asleep yeah it's not the best but that's only the first part to this dojin the more wholesome one is part two let's talk 451568 called i'll give you a one night stand two it's from the artist bro cd it's a multi-work series and like i said the first one really is not the most wholesome but without further ado let's get right into it the dojin starts out with the mc's inner thoughts about having a drinking party in his house which he was mad about however it's only him and Takahashi there his senpai he wanted to cancel it but she's super bored she tries to reassure him by saying it's not like she's gonna jump him or anything which isn't really the phrase he wanted to hear but she tells him to drink up because she bought too much thinking everyone was going so he says only a little but she gets a smirk and it cuts to a bunch of cans on the floor and Takahashi asleep with the MC looking down at her he doesn't know what to do so he tries to wake her up trying to tell her that she'll miss her train but he gets distracted by the 
booba and starts imagining things. But good on him for not taking advantage of the situation at least. He goes to sit down because God knows what she'll do if she sees that. But she sneaks up behind him because she's been awake the entire time. And she knows about the extra blood flow. He pushes her off saying that she won't attack him. But she grabs him saying that this isn't really her jumping him. She's just meeting his needs. So yeah, uh, that happens. But in the middle of that, he's saying that he's happy she's doing this for him. But it's not like they're dating and he thinks she'd find a better guy than him. And she has to reassure her point that she's going through this because she likes him. And that isn't the problem. And his mind knows that. But he doesn't stop. And in the middle of this, she says that she loves him. They finish up and it cuts to them not in his house. They're out and about. The two are talking about how Takeru should call her by her name, Kohane, which he does. He starts thinking about how he'll be led around by her forever, but is tired of thinking. She tells him that they'll be doing it again tonight until he gets used to it. And the dungeon ends with him thinking he can't really deal with her. And some illegal hand-holding. Overall, I rate this a 9 out of 10. It's pretty wholesome, all things considered. The art style was really good, and the story was pretty good for both parts. The characters were likable and pretty fun throughout the story. It was just overall really good. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. Let's talk 4464445. That's right, I'm back. This doujin is called Ambertown, the season with cherry blossoms. It's from the artist Miyama. It doesn't have a lot of tags, but skimming through it, it's one of the most wholesome ones I've read in a hot minute. So let's jump right into it. The doujin starts out outside with someone walking, talking about getting paid while thinking about some sushi. But he overhears someone asking for help, and he looks to see a face full of- <laughs> This botox is asking for help. So he pulls out, pulls her out. She goes to thank him for helping her, but can't find him. Which he looks down and sees the short king himself who helped her. Which gives her the impression that he's such a helpful kid, which irks him. Causing him to scream that he's 18 years old. The same age as her. P.S. I know this is like an accident. I'm just, they're just, they're, they're 18. Yeah. The two introduce themselves to each other before Kohaku asks why she's following him. Sakurako still wants to show her gratitude for helping her. And goes on explaining before getting cut off by her stomach growling. Kohaku says they should just go somewhere to eat. Thinking she looks rich, so he might as well get a free meal out of her. They go to the sushi bar foreshadowed earlier, which she's fascinated because she's never been in one before. He asks about her, asking if her name means she's a local celebrity and why she was in that predicament. She's going to be leaving the city to study abroad next year and wanted to explore the city. But then some prize thing catches her eye, where if you insert a plate, you can receive a prize. She wants to try it, even though he tells her it's just a trick for the kids. But she inserts a plate and waits before getting denied, and he reiterates his point from before. But he throws a plate in and wins the prize, a small little keychain, which he gives to her and she has an overreaction. They go to pay, and Sakurako takes out her card before being told it's only cash. And now Kohaku has to spend his paycheck. They leave and she apologizes again. She goes on complimenting him, calling him nice and big hearted. But she asks him to teach her various more things before she leaves the city. But she says yeah in his free time, but she makes plans for tomorrow, saying it's a promise. And it sets in with him that he has to hang out with her for one more year. So now they go around, and his daily life with Sakuroko became the norm. It was a pain in his rear, but it was somewhat pleasant. And what he thought was a long time before had passed in a flash, and he gets a text from Sakuroko that her study abroad schedule is official and she wants to meet him one last time. They meet up where they first met, and instead of going somewhere or having like a picnic, he doesn't want to go anywhere, since this is the last time they'll see each other like this. He turns to go, and she turns to go after him. But the charm on her bag from the sushi place falls into the water, and she chases after it, jumping into the water searching for it. He grabs her and pulls her towards him, and she's crying about how it's the first present he gave her, and it would be okay if they were separated as long as she had that. He then hugs her and says that he'll give her as much as that stuff as she wants and tells her don't you dare cry. It cuts to a house and the two confess their feelings for each other and then they do the deed before saying that this isn't going to be a memory and that he'll find her in the future and they continue. They finish up and it cuts to an airport. Three years have passed since that day and it's been long enough to forget their promise. She sits in a park thinking about how he might not remember it and she still thinks about it getting depressed over the thought of wanting to see him again but then someone stops in front of her saying she forgot something and in her eyes you see the keychain and the two meet up again and she's surprised because he hasn't forgotten their promise. She starts tearing up and goes to hug him, knocking him backwards, and the dojin ends with her saying that they'll always be together. Overall, I rate this a 10 out of 10. It was such a new change of pace with comedy aspects and wholesome moments mixed together so well. The art style was definitely unique, but I also really liked it. Check it out for yourself as always. Sauce is making its return on this channel. 
though I'm only planning of doing it like once or twice a month, if at all. Welcome back to Discord Sauce. This is episode six, and today we have a lot of submissions. If you're new here, what happens is I ask my Discord for sauce and review them in this video. Like I said, we have a lot of submissions, so let's just get right into it. Our first sauce is one, two, three, four, five, six from Cat Jam. Now this one is just straight up weird, and I already did a review on it, but it's a four out of ten. Our next one is Lacker Lack with three five three three seven eight. It's a Genshin Impact parody featured Kaching, and it's just a weird in public one seven out of ten next is from this user with 403961 it's a yuri one and honestly really wholesome eight out of ten next is from onoka with 329554 it's a milf sauce and also a cosplay sauce so it's a 7.5 out of ten next is some german dude with 432267. And this one needs some context. There's a manga from this same artist with a bunch of soons in it, and it's a really wholesome manga. And the same goes for this sauce. 9 out of 10. Next is from Captain7 with 217605. It's a transformation sauce and kind of weird. 7 out of 10. Next is Megumi with 437918. It's emotionless with a weird plot, but kind of wholesome near the end. 8.5 out of 10. Next is an Akame got kill sauce from working on it totally. It's between the hairstylist and the main character, and it's just a generic sauce sauce really 6.5 out of 10 next is chess with 298547 saying it was a funny read and it is even breaking the fourth wall here it's a good read as well so 8.5 out of 10 next is just absolutely messed up so good job you got a zero the last sauce i have for you is from nokaya 383538 it's a blind sauce but pretty wholesome all throughout so i'm gonna give it a 9 out of 10 and that's it for me join my discord to be part of the next one of these i do a silent voice or koi no Kotachi is a critically acclaimed anime movie directed by naoko yamada it's a production from the Studio Kyoto Animations, who made works like Kaon and Violet Evergarden. It's a very emotional story following Shoya Ishida both throughout his childhood and late high school years. It's the story of him and Shoko Nishimiya, a deaf girl who was bullied by Shoya with only the best elementary school banter. The film explores this theme of bullying, as well as other themes like isolation and redemption, all in the runtime of two hours and ten minutes. It also was one of the very few movies to be robbed for an Academy Award nomination for animation in 2018, but it was stolen by the fucking boss, baby. Though it did make its comeback in other award ceremonies, winning the Best Film Award in the 2017 Tokyo Anime Awards. But that's not how I heard of this movie. Because I heard about it from an AMV to the song Lover is a Day by Kuko. And this was the anime. But still, I want to talk about it. And with all the videos already made on this movie, it really shows how much this movie really impacted the anime community and whole world in general. So let's go. As said earlier, the movie follows Shoya Ishida, who's listened to one too many Suicide Boys songs. But he's woken up by some fireworks and just continues living. Going through a flashback, Back, it's a montage of his childhood and how reckless he was before cutting to a classroom setting with his class getting a new student. This student walks in, but the teacher taps her shoulder so she can start flipping through a notebook, revealing that she's deaf. This is, of course, Shoko Nishimiya. Nothing really happens after that besides Shoya calling her weird. Holy but they lived a normal life and would continue to do so until Shoya starts bullying her because she's deaf. Shoka tried to stay positive throughout this and would eventually end up making friends with another girl in her class, Sahara, that's trying to learn sign language to talk to her. Though Sahara would also end up being bullied for a different reason and leaving school, and Shoka would still be bullied. Shoya starts doing stuff like stealing her hearing aids and throwing her notebook into a fountain. It got really bad, and when Shoko is absent, their teachers do an announcement to the classroom and basically call out Shoya for all the BS he's been doing. This announcement didn't end up well for Shoya, and in the end, his classmates and friends started bullying him in return. Shoya didn't think anything of it at first, as he continued on, and just thought that his quote-unquote friends were playing jokes on him, and he still bullied Shoka. Shoya and his mother would go to Shoka's apartment in order to pay them back for all the lost and destroyed hearing aids, but something happens between the mothers, and now Miyako is kind of beaten up. He would see Shoko after school cleaning off a desk, thinking that she must still be getting bullied until realizing later that it's his desk. Shoya calls her a creep, and they get into this altercation. Though the bullying would be become a lot, and Shoko would end up transferring schools. It wasn't until after this altercation and Shoko leaving that he would realize all the writings on his desk and how much she did for him even though he treated her poorly. It cuts back to the present with Shoya walking into a building to a sign language classroom, only to see her walk behind him and the two meet up for the first time since the sixth grade. She tries just tries before turning to run but he does catch up and tries to hand her back her old journal from back then and has learned sign language which surprises her and he hands back the journal and then asks her to be friends and turns away to slap himself she's hiding her face looking like she's about to cry and then it goes to him waking up from a dream his little sister maria is waking him up but he goes to his calendar and decides to fix it before 
before heading down to breakfast, only to be confronted by his mom, who threatens him into saying he won't commit on a lie. Which, yeah, he says that and all. Then it shows him going over his whole plan for the day again with his bike ride to school. He's going to jump off the bridge, and going to see Shoko is part of that plan as well. And then he gets embarrassed about what happened. He's now at school after some backstory about how isolated he became, and sees that he hasn't changed. The X's on people's faces show that he can't trust nor care about anyone there, which he's completely fine with, just covering his ears not to hear the noise. Shoya can't even care for his teachers, and thinks people are saying all these bad things about him with him being lonely and how he shouldn't be there. But it shows him at lunch eating it and recognizing someone else eating by the trash can, and thinks about if he can go see Shoko again. He goes about his life that day and sees the kid from earlier getting his bike stolen, but instead lends his, which he doesn't get back. He's walking home and needs an excuse to go see Shoko again, which a coupon just so happens to appear with his excuse. But he's stopped by this guy, and this guy is important later on, but we'll skip past that and go to see this kid from earlier bringing back his bike. This is the first time there isn't an X on someone's face from his school, indicating Ichida's first friend. I guess if you exclude Shoko or something, because it's not really said that they're actual friends. But they do as friends do, go around and hanging out. Ishida doesn't really get this whole friends thing though. But to explain it, Nagatsuka does this handshake and says that requirements are shit. This comment just rocks his world, and his world gets even more rocked when this kid tells him that they're Shoko's boyfriend. Which this kid also just tells him that if he's here to make himself feel better, then to just leave. But of course, the comic relief character is also there and just kind of doing his thing. This big commotion leads to Shoko seeing that Ishida's there and Ishida running away, this time being chased by her. And they finally meet up again, both trying to find a reason to see each other. Though while they're feeding Carp, her notebook falls in and she jumps after it, which she also jumps in after her. This all happens in the opening 40 minutes of the film and really shows these themes of isolation and relationships. Ishida's attempts to repair his mistakes he made when he was younger and meeting people along the way, building up new friendships and rewriting his wrong. The isolation he felt before is nothing compared to how he starts to change. With him building friendships and repairing his relationship with Shoko, Ishida's change brought with it a change of heart as well, with him developing empathy and caring for other people around him, which is represented by the axes on people's faces. The film is a masterpiece, teaching us not only how to listen with our ears, but with our hearts. It's been a hot minute since I've done one of these. <laughs> so, rating TikTok Soft 6. This one's from the user XRE Anime Edit 12, and it's a parody edition. So let's jump in with our first sauce, 347 7019. It's of Rin from the Fate series. Both of the sauces on this TikTok are kind of cursed, so I'm just going to rate them both a 6 out of 10. Next is 02, and it's 354481. Basically, she just kind of does it with some random guy in the mech, and yeah, that's it. It's also in Chinese, 7 out of 10. Next is of Nobara from Jujutsu Kaisen, 433368. Basically, both Nobara and Yuji go to the beach and do it there, and it's also in Japanese, 7 out of 10. Next is a Rent a Girlfriend parody, 419779. What happened? happens is basically Kazuya does it with Sumi before doing it with Chizuru. It's a very basic setup and all, so it's going to be an 8 out of 10. Next is a Kakiguri parody, 221172. It's basically just the main trio having a good time, 7 out of 10. Next is a Demon Slayer parody with Shinobu, 433408. And what happens is she and Gyu just have a good time. It's a really cool art style though, 8.5 out of 10. Next is 419179, and it's a One Punch Man parody. The Tornado duo are trying to win over Saitama and they just end up all doing it together. It's fairly straightforward. 7.5 out of 10. Next is 328212, and it's a Naruto parody. There's no setup or anything, just Hinata and Naruto doing it. 7 out of 10. Next is a Fate parody with Shiro, but it's also kind of illegal, so no dice. Meaning the last sauce I have for you today is another Fate one, this time with Saber. It's 370482, and it's a fairly straightforward one. Rin gets Saber drunk, and then she does it with the guy. It's gonna have to be an 8.5 out of 10 from me. That concludes this TikTok sauce. I have a hard time finding these, so send them in my Discord for the possibility of being a video. Let's talk 432255 called The Show Must Go On. It's from the artist Chicken. It's a cute tomboy sauce, so let's jump into it. It starts out with someone monologuing with this girl doing a play or something, I don't really know. But it cuts to after they are finished, which it was just them advertising the drama club. The club is congratulating Akira on her amazing performance out there. She's flattered, but notices someone with a picture moving it and excuses herself. She then walks over to Ryo, does what any self-centered person does, and asks for compliments. Which he doesn't play into at all, and instead asks her to help with cleanup. But he does end up giving her what she was looking for, complimenting her performance and delivering of lines. even calling 
make her a natural born actor, which gives her a huge smile and turns her into Pinocchio with how much cap she's spitting, which Rio tries to stop. Anyway, they move those paintings and she starts admiring the costumes he's made. All the props and costumes were made by him and it's honestly surprising that he has that much talent for it, but he tries to play it off like it's nothing, mainly because it's the only path he had available in the club with his chops and such. She goes to start saying something, but stops herself and starts to say something else. Something about hearing her out after the next competition. He looks like he just doesn't care, but asks why she just doesn't tell him now. She wants the timing to be right, but he cuts her off saying they should just go back to the gym for now, with some shenanigans on the way. It now cuts to a montage sequence of them practicing before the big competition, and them at the big competition, with her singing and panting to a whole crowd. And then afterwards with everyone crying and such, even Ryu. It cuts to them after all that, and at an auditorium with Akira giving a speech. Something about how they came in second, how the third years are leaving, and thanking them for their hard work. It then cuts again to a room, with someone walking in on Ryu standing alone. It's, of course, Akira, who's there to apologize to him for all the quote-unquote wasted effort that they put into the props and costumes. He says not to worry about it, they did the best they could, but he wants to thank her. He realized that even if he can't be a star himself, he can help other stars shine even brighter with his effort. He decided to go to an arts college partially because he saw her like that, but he's really just trying to say thanks, which he then gets teased for smiling. But she thanks him again for the clothes he makes, because they always cheer her up, and that he definitely makes her shine, which makes him happy, but then he remembers that she wanted to bring something up after the competition was over. She bites him. Yeah, he's confused because she flubbed it, and then gets super defensive and tries again, telling him that she likes him. He thinks she's gotta be joking, because he's fat and short and just him. She says all this stuff about how she can rely on him, how he calms her down and his clothes and all that, and then asks for his reply. But she pauses, and then stutters before hugging her, saying it's his response. She pulls a wimpy smile and hugs him back, and then they make that deleted scene from Romeo and Juliet. Okay, so um, I actually messed up here, because the deleted scene from Romeo and Juliet is when Romeo gets the poison, um, but that was deleted because of like young audience and such so instead we're just gonna say fucking uh the little dog laughed yeah. It cuts to afterwards with them walking, talking about the future. She's probably going to go to an arts college as well, since she's going to need him by her side and all that. They then do this thing, which is a weird way to say that she wants him to help her in her journey, which she's put a lot of serious thought into, because she's saying it won't be long until her debut as the brightest star in the sky. It then cuts to nine years later with someone yelling at Ryo. It's, of course, Akira yelling at him about a director. But my man is dying over here with how much luggage she has, because she just had to have a lot of outfits with her. And the dojin ends with them making their way to a Hollywood debut as a couple. Overall, I rate this a 9.5 out of 10. It's a really heartwarming read with some comedy aspects, and I really liked reading it overall. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. Let me paint a picture for you. You walk through a park, which doesn't normally happen, and you see this cat girl sitting on a bench. Since you're watching this channel, I can only assume you'd pull a Shane Dawson on that being. And that's what we're here to discuss today. The best kimono mimi sauces, aka the best of cat girls, dog girls, and anything that influencers like Shao Tucker would create. I have three sauces for you today before someone breaks into my house again. To understand that joke, you need to watch the elf sauces. So let's get right into this first one, 253091. It's called Flowers for Shion, and it's from the artist Nekoi Hikaru. And it follows the main guy, an author whose deadline is very soon, and he's always lived alone until recently. But yesterday, this strange lady barged into his life. He came home one day, but then suddenly there was a girl in front of his door who was staring at him. He tries to ignore her, but then she asks to come in. So he lets her in for one night and feeds her. Though instead of using chopsticks for her food, she just sticks her whole face in it, which gets her yelled at, but it's fun that way. And it finally settles in with the MC about what he's gotten himself into. He goes to work, saying not to bug him, which of course she's just gonna walk up and bug him to play. He can't, but she's very insistent on him playing, to the point where she licks him while he's talking, which of course he would scream afterward, and he sits her down on the couch while he works. He walks back to his desk while she's singing, and she's acting just like a cat, which is when she sees a photo of a cat that he used to have. He starts telling his story about Shion, the cat, but she's caught up on that name. Sadly, Shion isn't around anymore after a fire that happened. No matter how hard he screamed, no one helped. It became too late, and everything was gone in an instant. People tried to cheer him up by saying that at least he's alright, but he considered Shion part of his family, and he still catches himself thinking that if only she was alive today. He then apologizes to her for rambling on, but she has this look like she's about to do something. Then there's a cut to the words, I've finally found you, and Shion is there walking towards him, and it can't be a dream because he's actually touching it, but that's when she transforms back and is now on top of him, giving him her thanks for staying the night or something, and it's revealed during the 
the deed that she's actually like Shion or something. They finish up and fall asleep. He wakes up and thinks it was all a dream, but notices the collar on the bed before noticing the whole ass cat girl as well, who wakes up and greets him as he starts crying. He can't stop crying because it just wasn't a dream. And the doesn't end. I rate this one a 9.5 out of 10. I don't really like how it's his actual cat that transformed into a girl, but you know, you can't win them all. But hopefully this next sauce can save it. Let's talk 205982. It's called Thinking of You, and it's from the artist Fumitsuki So. It follows this guy walking down the street until he notices a cafe, thinking he should stop by. He walks in and notices something. One of the workers there is a cat girl. Big surprise, whoa. And it cuts to him walking in again, different time, and her greeting him. Since that day, he's been going to the cafe whenever he's had free time, to the point where the girl knows his work hours, so he sits at his usual table and orders, and watches her as she goes off, admiring her hair, white skin, and those ears and tails that would catch anyone's attention. But all he knows about her is that her name is Sai, though he can't imagine she'd tell him any more than that. She hands him his order, and he does a glare to a close-up of his coffee. It cuts to later in a park, with him sitting on a bench, but of course she bumps into him and surprises him. He was headed home after work and took a break, and she just got done talking to an old regular for hours about this and that, and never expected to meet him there. He just says out of the blue that he loves her, and immediately backtracks on it, till she says that it's gotten quite cold out, and asks if she could go over to his house while grabbing onto him. So the two go to his house, and have a little small talk before she puts her hands together, and tells him that she's interested in him too. He's always sat at the same table drinking iced coffee, seemingly deep in thought. Even the owner was telling her to focus on her job instead of eyeing him. But she apologizes for her story, and he suddenly hugs her. The two hug it out, share a kiss, and share a good time. They finish up, and she asks if he's still gonna go to the cafe every day, which he will. She's glad to hear that, and will be waiting for him. And the dojo Overall, I rate this one another 9.5 out of 10. Everything about this was amazing, and I really enjoyed it. Off topic, it's almost time for someone to break into my house again, so hopefully I can get this last sauce done before then. Let's talk 194351. It's called Okitsune Winter, and it's from the artist Kase. It's a fox girl this time, so let's go. It starts with the market having its end of year sale, and the main guy carrying a ton of stuff. Not even sure if it'll fit in his fridge, but he'll manage. But suddenly, a random fox girl runs up behind him and jumps on him. It's just Inaho, who simply couldn't contain her happiness when she saw him. Yeah, she's selfless. But he hands her some fried tofu and they start walking. She doesn't know why she's so fond of tofu, but maybe it's because it's what people think she should like. That's because it's a common offering at Inari Shrines, but it's a pretty silly explanation for it, and there's some more backstory. Yoshihiro lost his family and closed himself off from the world when out of nowhere Inaho appeared, and she just kind of stuck around since. He was saved by her cheeriness, but doesn't know if she's an actual god or not. But it cuts to later, and cuts to them doing the deed. It cuts again to them at a shrine praying, and them wishing for another good year. They do a cute couple thing, then they go check out their luck. He gets excellent luck, and they write a blessing on a tree. And the dojin ends with them going for some Amazake. Overall, I rate this an 8.5 out of 10. There's really no closure on it, but it was still a good read and a unique art style. And yeah, you know the drill already. I've been foreshadowing this. Just cut to him already. All right, you cultured cum dumpsters. Let's skip the introductions and just get into it. In 238577, we are introduced to a lovable girl with big honkers, where she's hanging out with this dude after he saved her in the side of the street. And after patching up her feet and not being able to walk anywhere, he is decided to let her stay in his house. Despite not knowing anything about her except for the fact that she's cute and kind and for some reason is wearing fancy clothes in the countryside. This is what you call foreshadowing. Later on, they hear knocking and was met with two Jimbos who are searching for a cat monster. Then they gave him whatever this thing is and told him that it will make the cat monster go crazy. After they leave, he finds her fucking dying. So obviously he starts to panic, only for her to grab him by the head and nuzzle him. This goes on for another minute until it is revealed that she was the cat monster all along. See, if you guys noticed, that's what they were foreshadowing on. And after a few more alluring lines, they do the deed. I'm not gonna spoil anything else because there's more wholesomeness to it during the quote-unquote action scene, so just go and read it. The art is great, the lewdness is hot, and overall, I would give this sauce a 9 out of 10. Next up, we got a... God! Are you... Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, next up, we got a pretty simple and hot doujin with a quick premise. Dude is depressed from work and walks into a maid cafe. And the girl that we saw before, oh my lord. <laughs> the girl we saw before offered him this special course and promises to give him a good time. And if you're wondering what this special course is, dude asks for a coffee and when asked to provide milk too, she goes and does this. And later on, after enjoying the coffee, he asks for the double pudding. And, um, 
yeah, you guys know where this is going. Like I said, this is just something quick, so if you want a mindless session without thinking over stuff, then this one is for you. 8.5 out of 10. And finally, last but not least, we got 363332. We are introduced with a master and maid relationship, and the master is a little bit behind on money, and she was like, Bonk, Baka Master, go and find a job. To which he was like, I do got a job, and shows her his collection of candid shots of her. To which she told him to stop, because, I mean, come on, he did it without her permission. That's kind of fucked up. And she was like, go find a proper job, Baka Master, or else I won't be able to s stay with you anymore. Oh damn, I almost got emotional there. But after some cute bantering between our two lovebirds, our main boy with his infinite riz starts making out with her to convince her to help him with a live stream. And oh my god, she's fucking adorable. And so they do the stream, and it's like, whatever, I guess. But halfway through it, she just starts getting wet. I mean, it's a surprise but a welcome one. And after not being able to take it anymore, she slams the livestream down and does one of the cutest faces ever known to man. And so they do the deed. I can't even really tell you guys what's so good about this doujin and why I love it so damn much, but this is probably the best Kimono Mimi doujin I have read. I guess the best part of it that I can kinda highlight are the dialogues between the couple and the character designs of the waifu, cause I like kimonos and I also like fox girls. Plus, she's also a little cindere. I don't know, she just really works for me. NC Boy could do some work, but for now, he's just good for the waifu to bounce off of. And yeah, I suppose that's the best way I could say about him. That's why it's not perfect, but either way, I am giving this cute ass doujin a 9.5 out of 10. Alright, Makima, I think I've done my job here, so I'm gonna leave this video back to you. Anyway, go check out all these sauces as always. I don't know what else to say. Imagine something for me real quick. You're hurrying to take out the garbage one day but miss the truck, and your neighbor gives you crap for missing it twice. But from there on, your luck just kept getting worse and worse, getting scolded for your senior's mistake, getting someone else's curry on your shirt, and forgetting your key on your desk at work. And that's when the same neighbor walks out of her place to go to the store, and you accompany her for some reason. To not give too much away, that's where I'm going to end the short summary. But that's the story of the sauce series I have for you today. This series is another one of Hiryo's amazing works, and it, it's pretty alright. Let's just get right into it. The first sauce starts out pretty much the same as I already explained it. There's some electronics saying that there's going to be lots of bad luck today, which includes the main character taking out the garbage, but he missed it and just stares as the truck drives off, but someone says that's a shame, as we see this girl asking if it's the second time he's missed it. The girl starts lecturing him and he tells us that this is his neighbor who barely shows her face. He also thinks that this is bad and that today's luck just kept getting worse. There's then a series of shots where he gets blamed for his senior's mistake, gets curry on a shirt that wasn't even from his food, and left his apartment key on his desk. It's late though, the landlord's probably asleep, and calling a locksmith would take some time. He says it's unlucky as someone asks him what is. It's his neighbor asking what he's doing down there, which is the last person he wanted to see. But he tells her that due to some circumstances, he can't get into his apartment, which she mocks him for forgetting his key. She tells him that she was going to go to the store and asks if it's dangerous for a woman to walk alone at midnight and asks him to go with her. At the store, he thinks that he can't refuse after that, but she offers to let him stay at her place tonight, which shocks him. He asks why she can just let a strange man into her room so easily, which she says a neighbor isn't a stranger, and that anyone who accompanies a strange woman shopping can't be that bad, and also makes fun of him. There's some banter while he still thinks about bad luck, and he zones out and such, which she asks about after they leave. They go to her place, which is a mess, and she tells him to sit where Forever. She starts lecturing him about how much he's messing up and oversleeping this morning. His alarm kept going off and he started stomping, which is why she thought he was a frequent oversleeper and he apologizes for the noise. But she says it's fine because it's funny. But because of that, she wanted to talk to him. Then goes on venting, saying that she's a writer and always works alone and doesn't have a friend to keep her company. He says he kind of understands and tells her to be prepared to be called on. He complains about it being hot as she turns off her AC at night, but starts to undress as he turns away saying, she's too lightly dressed, which she has a completely valid argument for. He's struggling to find somewhere to look, which she flirts with him and he has a reasonable response. She says that won't be a problem though and holds up a box, which is what he was looking at at the store. She said all those things to get in his head and was disappointed when he didn't buy them. But this is what she intended from the start, since seeing him in the hallway made her heart skip a beat. And she asks him if he would like to keep her company, and they do it. It cuts to a morning and he made it to the trash, which someone compliments him for. 
It's of course her asking if it's great to get up early, making fun of him. She wishes him a good day and he says goodbye. And he's having good luck that day. The next part of the series starts with them doing it for a bit and then cuts to him catching a train with him barely missing Ayane that morning. But that's when she calls him saying that they miss each other that morning and he asks if he can help her with something. She just wanted to tell him to take care and have a nice day, which is why she called. She asks if that makes him happy, but his co-worker sees he's grinning and asks who he's on the phone with and she starts to take a deep breath, only to scream that this is his convenient neighbor cat speaking and they banter about that until he hangs up on her. She sits for a bit and gets an idea. There's a shot of the city while the first day of the business trip wraps up and he's in his room undressing, but he gets a photo on his phone, which we expected to see that. He frantically asks what that was and she says she's just providing material for him and it worked because he's getting flashbacks to their time together and gets excited but before he can get rid of it gets interrupted by his co-worker from before informing him about a gathering below which is where he decides that those picks are off limits while on the trip and immediately gets sent another one the next day. They call and he tells her that he didn't use it which makes sense since he's at work. She tells him she did it and then goes into way too much detail about it embarrassing him but he tells her that he won't do it until they do the real thing which she smiles and says she's looking forward to it and hangs up he just sits back in his chair and wants to go home the next morning he's really depressed which his co-workers realize it's the next day and he didn't sleep well the night before and she sends him another one with impeccable timing he then starts analyzing the quality of the pictures and thinks she does that in her spare time but his co-worker snaps him out of it and he gets back to work and finishes the job he takes a train back and declines his co-workers invitation to go out and on his way way up to his apartment he starts thinking about INA and decides to shower first but as he goes to open his apartment door she opens it for him and she does this classic thing with the bath dinner or her this flipped a switch and he pushes her on the bed and they do it they finish up and go through her gallery showing she took a lot of selfies to get those three she worked hard for those pictures since it was the first time she's done that and he asks her why she did it so suddenly which it's obviously just to tease him but she did have another goal in mind for him to think of her even on the road which brings us to the final part of the series. It starts out with the guy, Kago, buying some stuff at a store, but some girl walks up saying fancy meeting him here. He pauses for a moment before realizing it's INA, and the only reason he couldn't recognize her is because of how she normally looked. He looks the same to her since he doesn't work from home, but she asks him if he likes her outfit, which he thinks is a trick question, because of course he does, and she smiles. They start catching up and bugging the other people there, even making plans to go get dinner before going home. They go out drinking, and he says it's been a while since he drank with people outside work. He tells him he could have just invited her out, which he never considered, and she gets all defensive about it, but it brings up their relationship. They're not dating, but have a good time, and they're really only good time friends, and if they started dating, would it solve everything? But it's a bit late for that, and they couldn't really pull off a proper relationship. There's some more banter between them, and they figure out they're both pretty lonely people, but so what if they're just not dating and just good time friends? There's no reason for them to fit some mold, but she plays it off as her being drunk. She calls over the waiter for some refills and someone goes out to her. It's this guy she recognizes who sees Kago and walks off. That guy is her ex who she dated back in college. They haven't seen each other since and he reminds her of the mold again. She's burning up and he's in a teasing mood according to her, but he just realized that even after they've done it so many times, there's still new sides of her he hasn't seen. She calls him a tease and he says it's cold out and they'll freeze by the time they go home, so he proposes they go warm up a little bit and go to a hotel and just immediately start doing it. They finish up and are talking about the time they had last night and she teases him for the final line he said be my woman joking saying what if she took him seriously but he was being serious he started to say it again but she walks over to shut him up saying he can't say that she really likes what they have right now just the two of them doing their thing so he can't say that she wants to have more fun than maybe hear him out but she'll always save him a spot since he's her neighbor he shakes it off and calls her a piece of work they continue walking and she wants him to give her a review but he clenches the envelope he's holding in frustration. I know it's a cliffhanger, but that's the end of the series. Overall, I rate this a solid 9.5 out of 10. It's a long soft series, which you don't find often, and has a lot of development throughout. And don't even get me started on the art. It's just so good. The one thing dragging the score down, though, is the ending where she rejects him, and that's really it. The entire series was amazing, and it's just another amazing series from Hiryo. And if there's another part to this, I'll be sure to review it. But for now, 
I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. Now, before the video starts, I just want to say that we are so close to hitting 100,000 subscribers on this channel, and it would be amazing to hit that before the end of the year. So if you're new to the channel and like what you see, or keep coming back on the regular and aren't already subscribed, why not? It's free and it really helps out the channel. But anyway, what if you're an average wage slave working a corporate job and have a sort of rivalry going on between you and your coworker, and it reached the point where your rivalry happened so much that your other co-workers at the job just accept it as a daily event. But something happens after work one day and the two of you end up naked in bed together, only realizing the next morning. Well, that's the story of the dojin I have for you today. Let's talk 485930 called I Want to Try It Again. It's from the absolute GOAT Danny Maru. And since it's from the GOAT, you already know it's gonna be amazing. So let's get right into it. The dojo starts out with a shot of a city and a meeting about a new line of cookies. That's when someone raises their hand, very excited about this. It's this girl, Yuna, who proposes a cookie targeted towards women who want to watch the calories and to make a cookie with vegetables in it. The guy next to her, Yuto, one-ups her idea, saying they should target it towards students who want to fill their belly and make a cookie that's pizza flavored. The two, of course, get at each other's throat about the other's terrible idea as their co-workers realize it's the same stuff different day and say that their constant fighting means that they're a good match for each other which is the one thing they agree on. Yuta says that he's doing well without a dog girl biting his ankles and Yuna says that she wants nothing to do with a monkey brained idiot like him all while the boss is coming to this realization too. It cuts to after and the two are still arguing about the meeting and he says that if she's going to continue to complain then they should after work and there's a montage of the two arguing in different places like a bar and such, and it cuts to the same city shot in the morning. The two wake up naked, see each other, and scream. They're obviously both confused, then take a moment and frantically get out of the hotel in five minutes. The two agree with each other that nothing happened between them, and even reassure themselves later on. She's thinking about how they got there, and all he remembers is drinking at a bar, but the one thing they both remember is that they had a really good time. It cuts to their office again, and the boss is wrapping up another meeting. He points out that the two are quiet today, but they're too worried about what happened yesterday to focus. It cuts to them looking for some documents and she trips, which he catches her and the two immediately get flustered by the other. It cuts again to some time later and someone leaving the office, leaving the two and their thoughts. She thought the feelings would go away, but she kept remembering the night and can't get it out of her head and same with the guy. And they think that maybe they could do it again. Hey, that's the name of the song! They finish up their overtime even while being distracted by that and it's already late. They need to hurry if they want to catch the last train, but pause for a second before she says they there's no way she's gonna make it since she's tired, which he invites her over to his place to rest. She takes that offer and they walk to his place and they immediately do it. They finish up and get real embarrassed afterwards. She's making fun of him for confessing, which he tries to play off, and she tries to play off going out, which he immediately calls her out for. And instead of fighting like they usually do, they just laugh and she goes to kiss him again. It cuts to the next day with the same city shot and the two react to their proposals being refused and the dungeon ends. Overall, I rate this a 10 out of 10. It's just such a good read. Like I said earlier, I already knew it was going to be amazing since it's a Danny Maru work. We did an amazing job on both the story and art style, but this just completely shattered all my expectations once again. And I even like the touch with their names, which is pointed out in the end here, where the first part of their last names translates to monkey for Yuto and dog for Yuna, which if you remember is what they used to insult each other earlier on. It's just such a good read, and I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. So what if you're a no life in school who has a secret crush on the most popular girl, but you only admire her from a distance because you're also a realist. Though one day she approaches you and asks to speak with you after class. You originally joke that she's going to confess to you, but then she actually confesses to you. Well, that's the story of the dojin I have for you today. Let's talk 483294 called Classmate. It's from the artist Hara. It's a Gyaru tag and also full color, so let's get right into it. The dojin starts out with some background on the main girl, Erica. How she's the most popular girl, she's pretty and mature for her age, and has no real issue talking to people. A lot of guys have a crush on her, including the main guy right here, but he only admires from a distance since he thinks he won't be a good match. The only thing the two have in common is that they went to the same schools growing up, and he couldn't imagine them dating in the first place. But Erika walks up to Tanaka, asking if he's got a minute, and corrects him on her name. He asks if she needs something, and thinks they haven't talked in a while. There's something she wants to ask him though, and wants to go with him somewhere else. So he goes with her, joking to himself that she's gonna confess to him, but does actually end up confessing to him. So many thoughts run through his head like this must be a joke and how she hates doing those kinds of jokes so this must really be a confession and his heart is just 
thumping throughout this entire thing and tries to think of an answer while she asks what he thinks and says that he always loved her too which she doesn't react to at first then smirks saying her lifelong dream has come true showing she was serious but he asks her if she wants to date someone like him since he's got nothing going for him and is only really good at gaming and goes on saying that dating him would start gossip or put her in a bad situation which shows her that he has no self-esteem so she slams her hand next to him saying that she's casting a spell to boost his confidence and tells him to look into her eyes but of course his eyes wander elsewhere and she kisses him saying that was her first kiss and if he's more confident he wants to kiss her again which she says sure but in the middle of that kiss some people are walking towards them saying that they saw the two go there she grabs his hand saying she lives alone and that her apartment is close by and of course they go there at her place now she's telling him to place his bag anywhere and they go to her room and he walks up to her and kisses her and they do it they finish up and he asks why she loves him apparently back in elementary school there was a little incident that made her fall for him and that incident was his swimming trunks slipped and showed he had a big peepee. And she's been crazy about him ever since. And hey, that that's that's the entire reasoning for why what, the dungeon ends. But there's this cute art of Erica afterwards. Overall, I rate this a 6.5 out of 10. It's pretty alright, all things considered. I love the art style and the characters were alright. The story was okay, but very underwhelming with the backstory. Or the main thing that ties the whole story together. But what can I say? Big booba girl. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. So what if you're a regular at a cafe and have a crush on the waitress? So you work up the courage to ask her out and she agrees. But on your date, she starts to trauma dump on you about being cheerful and you decide to help her out in this escapade. Well, that's the story of the dojin I have for you today. Let's talk 213588 called How to Make a Smile. It's from the artist Yokaki. Not a lot of tags for this one, but it's pretty wholesome. So let's get right into it. The dojin starts out with the main girl, a waitress, delivering a coffee to someone. It's this guy hyping himself himself up in his mind as he goes to ask Kazumi out. So he pops a question and she just has no reaction which makes him think it's a fluke but she agrees. And it comes to him in this position as he's sitting with his friends wondering what's up. They're talking about her and how his friends thought she was some middle aged woman but is 20 and is a total outcast. They bring up the fact that she has a mean look and her booba but he runs off. It cuts to her waiting for him and he apologizes for making her wait even if he was 10 minutes early and he thinks she may have been looking forward to it. But they go to the cinema to see a movie and it cuts to after and they're saying it was fun. Then cuts to this cafe and the guy starts ranting about how he's glad he watched that movie and it's glad she told him about it. Then apologizes for talking too much. But she asks if he's a cheerful person and asks how he manages to be so cheerful. She apologizes for bringing it up so suddenly and it's something she's not sure what to do. Since the only person kind enough to hire her was her boss and she doesn't have anyone to talk to about it with. So Ueda, the guy, offers to help her and give her advice. She asks if he's serious and thanks him while he's just uh, trying to play it off. She talks about not being able to smile no matter how much effort she puts in and of course he had ulterior motives but really wanted to help her. It cuts to his friend from before judging him for reading a fashion magazine since he was thinking she should wear something brighter. It cuts again to them shopping and he picks out a dress for her which literally brings him to tears when she tries it on. The two go on more and more dates and laugh a whole lot until they get to this crane machine and she starts smiling which he immediately congratulates her for and she thanks him and says she can be cheerful now even just a little bit which to him is a cute just surprise attack it cuts to the cafe she works at again and she's bringing out a coffee and his friend sees that something's different about her he takes a credit with the thanks going to him but his friend says she's much cuter this way and runs to the toilet leaving ueda to overthink things thinking things like she's more cheerful and has a lovely smile but thinks he was doing this just to have leverage over her but she walks up and asks if he's okay and says that guy with him said her mood lightened up. She said that her boss said something similar and says that it's thanks to him as it shows the boss reminiscing but he says that she doesn't need to go out with him anymore and that she'll be fine which confuses her. Though he goes on saying that he was useful but she doesn't need to go out with him anymore and apologizes for having her tag along all this time. She asks why and starts crying. The boss calls her though and says he's leaving early if she could close the store. The boss leaves and meets Ueda's friend Ryuji and asks him to go out drinking but Ueda stands up and questions if she was crying just now. He looks over at her and she asks if he's bothering him or hurt him. He yells no is quite the opposite and to forget what he just said and apologizing saying that Ryuji was saying she was cute and that he got jealous and started to vent and that he wanted to keep going on dates with her. She hugs him and says she thought she may have gotten too vain which he says he should be saying that and goes on saying that outburst was his desire to monopolize her but the opposite that she's not really his or anything but just doesn't even know what he's 
saying at this point, but she asks him to make her his, and they just do it right then and there. They finish up and leave, and she apologizes for having him help clean up. They walk off as the boss and Ryuji are spying on them, with Ryuji asking if the boss knew it would turn out that way. But Kasumi asks if she could tell the boss about them, and owes him for the advice she asks. He says it would make him happy, and asks her out on another date, which she agrees. And the dungeon ends. Overall, I rate this a 10 out of 10. It's just so wholesome and just so good. The art style is really nice too, and I love the artist's use of costumes in this, and it's just generally a good read overall. I recommend you check it out for yourselves as always. Okay, so here's where the gaming section starts. If you're scrolling along the timeline and just find this, then yeah, here's where it starts. Me when I'm intimidated by the men, the men. No, 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 why, 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 why? Me when Honestly, I'm going for a I'm trick really... shot on Honestly, the Xbox 360. Guys, I got all the, I got all the weapons. I still have some, I have banana flavored vodka and I threw up in a toilet. Banana flavored? It's so good! Like? What does that taste like, bananas? I I, I said I was drinking banana flavored vodka and Lockheed goes, Can someone Oh, dude, banana flavored vodka? What's that taste like, banana? Uh, that, that was pretty funny. Where are you? Oh, you're the I'm better flash. Hey, no. Eric, I don't think they you like this. Uh, why don't you think that? Oh, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> my god. <laughs> We share one brain cell among us, and no one has it. Among us? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm ordering boba now. Fuck you. You've convinced me. Dude, boba's good. What do you mean? You're ordering booba? Dude, Damn, booba. notice how no one was laughing, Mason. I said lark. <laughs> Why are we still in the fucking corner? <laughs> There's been nothing happening. Oh, oh no! no. <laughs> <laughs> What's the happening? Oh hey, Logman. I give you a thumbs up. Can you email in this? No. You should be able to. Sometimes oh. it lets you. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Wait for us. Wait for us to role play this. Make make uh make slurping noses. I mean I guess. Uh, real, real quick, Mason, didn't you have to take a shit? I went back up. <laughs> <laughs> Funny and Indian Indian most Indian. Don't, don't even make do a prank call. Just do an actual bomb threat on a Home Depot. <laughs> 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 what is it with you and making like dubstep noises? <laughs> oh my god, all the sandbags while it's windy, one after another, just bop, bop, bop. Then you gotta put it up because guess what? The wind's relentless and the sandbags don't work against the wind. Oh, mother nature. What are you talking about? Bazooka ball! Oh god! They keep putting me at Bazooka ball! My weak ass can't fucking put it back! Anyways, so how's y'all days been? How did I manage? Man, can we get purple the fucking out of this lobby, bro? I'll be this vote, Keiko. Yeah. <laughs> Press F1 if you guys do it. Purple. Uh, F1, okay. Bye bye! I do not like you anymore! Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Some poor innocent guy. <laughs> He's trying to have a fun time. God, I'm so They're rusty. Hot. I'm rusty and crusty. Be hopping. Hopping B. Oh my daddy! I'm popping off. 
I'll spill milk on myself and you're gonna have me crying in your clip now. Yeah. Dude, I killed the ulti more than What is this game? That nade was deflectable. Yeah. Oh. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was nade being deflectable. Um. Look, what the fuck, gonna... Frost? Why'd you do no, that to no, me? No, no, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no. yeah, yeah, you start the deflecting Genji a fucking grenade again. <laughs> right after saying <laughs> I just found out. Beneath Hyrule Castle. Oh, I'm sorry, dude. That looks so breakable. Listen, listen. I've played enough Genshin Impact to know when a object looks breakable. This is breakable. Maybe not with this sword, but it is breakable. Bro, if you scroll, if you scroll north, you see this place called Pizza Connection. It's oh. called Pizza Connection. Where, like, look on Google Maps. Look up Pizza Connection. <laughs> I got a bunch of. I got an FBI document. <laughs> <laughs> what the f what did you make me look up? <laughs> uh, Frost, have you ever heard of the campaign that was titled Stop Asian Hate? Yeah, I, I went against that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you see that question mark on screen? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have a suppressor. Fuck. Oh, fuck. Who wa I, you walked through the metal detector? It, it wasn't us know. breaking into the fucking. Where we start? Restart. 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 No it way. wasn't I us. I didn't even know. I didn't know. <laughs> it wasn't us. Dude, it wasn't us like breaking <laughs> into the security office and shooting up everyone in there. It was you walking through the metal detector. <laughs> Alright, well hang on, hang on, hang on, let me uh... <laughs> I didn't even know there was a metal detector actually Dude, there! Were you not paying attention? <laughs> Your only goal, or like, the entire reason why I've been putting this off is because I need someone as like an emotional support buddy. I'm also like your hype man, but for like, hating other people, like, eh, f this bitch sucks! Yeah, dude, this fucking sh bro! Man. Oh yeah, uh, just so you don't say the n-word again. I'm recording. Why would I ever say Nick? You can put that in and like <laughs> cut out the, the, the collodion part. Yeah, that's what I was gonna do. Yeah. Regardless of what you said. But like, leave it somewhere else in the video, like at the end or something. And then... Hey Frost. Hey, hey Frost. Hey Frost. Yeah. Hey, hey, no. Hey Frost. Uh, oh. No! Is the thing out where your thing works better with the thing? <laughs> oh my fucking god! Frosty uh -huh. tips. Bob, do something. Bob just ran off the map. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Saved by two players, by the way. Oh, hell yeah, get it, bro. Dude, y'all keep saving me. Why am I being pocketed so hard? Because you're the only one here. Oh, I see. I want you to get out, but you're still in. Get out. Right. Never mind, stay in. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> this is a complicated romance novel. <laughs> Get out of my ass! Go back in! <laughs> <laughs> good ult, good ult. That bus stop didn't deserve that, for real. Uh oh. Ah, oh, dang it. Idiot! Fucking idiot! Don't push me! Sorry, just goes, yo, Kiriko, you need to focus. Bro, you shut up. Wow. 
Why is he speaking to me? I don't even know, bro. I got three. Please. I thought their name was Ravi Ridge. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> it's raviolis. That's how you pass the free. Cause I was getting heals while just being up in the air vibing. I. Did you sick break down? I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, I know. Oh shit! I'm in the wrong voice chat as well. <laughs> What? <laughs> uh. Off me, you fucking, fucking feet shower! What's up? <laughs> oh, I'm dead. He slept. Imagine, imagine thinking you're dead. Thank you, I love you. Oh my god, I'm getting blown the fuck up though. Holy shit. Dude, the god sleep! <laughs> imagine thinking you're dead when Kiriko exists. <laughs> Oh my god. I'm on my window trading arc, baby! Couldn't hear you from down there. Bro, was what? That their, I think that was their echo. No, that's their doom. Is he's it? Saying, he's saying that he's doom gapping you. What the or hell? Or tank gapping you. What the hell? I craft my own arrows. My Each brother in Christ, a roll of meditation. paper towel has more HP than me. Of course, I'm scared of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it back, eh? Throw it back, eh? Discord, we will find Hatsune Miku! I'm having fun playing Overwatch. Yeah, yeah, good. Suck him off, Frost. Good, 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 Suck good, him off, Frost. Good, 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 yeah! Yeah! Master is sucking! Woo! Marissa! Of course. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm just gonna run around, bro. What the fuck are they gonna do? Kill me? Anna's <laughs> off. <laughs> Anna's <laughs> off? What the fuck? That was sick. I like women. I'm not gay. I'm not gay. I'm not gay. Oh, then not this is this is gonna seem really awkward then. Oh no. Man strength. Man strength. <laughs> no, not. That's all it is. That's the entire shirt. There's nothing else. <laughs> you know what uh, I'm getting from looking at this the most though? What? I'm fat as hell. Alright, here you get to watch you want you wanna see the fritties? You want you wanna take a peek at the fritties? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Freeze! <laughs> you can't tell, but I just like raised my arms and like rejoice. Go back a bit. Where's our Ryan is just in. He's so dead. Get in. We win here. Just can go. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Get that monk. Oh, wait, that could be. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of running around, bro. Oh, I f***ed up the roll. See, and then we get a... I gotta go. What is on point? Two things. Jesse. Oh, he left. Jesse.
Jet. Ah! Uh, I did not mean to do that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I I forgot that my shift is not a normal sprint. I'm so sorry. Here, have my son. <laughs> is that a mine? <laughs> oh, I fucking love that. Is that a mine? There's just an explosion <laughs> in the background. <laughs> what was that one song? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I had this song stuck in my head a couple nights ago, and because my because because Itzy was singing it, I was like I was gonna look it up, and I got back to my room, but I forgot. And I was like, oh yeah, I was gonna look what up that song. I really want to hear it. So I was I just asked you guys just now. I was like, do, do you guys know what that song is? I was like, what's that song where? But I forgot all the lyrics that I couldn't explain. <laughs> so I was just like, what's that song where? And then made a Neanderthal face. <laughs> and I didn't even realize I was making that face until I realized I felt it in my facial muscles that I was like contracting my face. Because <laughs> I was trying to think. <laughs> I just, I just need to see something real quick. They said there was going to be something about fishing. It might not be on this map. Yeah, I don't think it's on this part of it, so. Here we go. Fishing! Yeah! And then, where's the penguin? Where's the penguin? Oh, there he is. Oh, let's go! Season three, baby! Me, when they ask what, where popcorn comes from. Kernels. <laughs> I hate you. I fucking hate you, bro. That was shit. That was actually so dog. <laughs> that that like, yeah, that's. Oh. Yeah. I said gay that. furry. Uh, gay furry fat. fat. Gay it's fat furry. Gay furry fat, bro. Pick a trauma. Oh yeah, four. <laughs> Pick a trauma. <laughs> he he really has all like the fucking. Bro, he's fucking he min maxing he traumas. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, it's below. Dead it's ass, this door's marked. Wasting your money. This door's literally still marked. I bought a gun. Oh, I didn't fucking. I didn't fucking. It do just shit. stopped being marked. No. It just stopped being marked. I will clip it. You Markiplier, fucking. Markiplier, 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 Markiplier. Oh, he's back. The, the second coming. <laughs> I was like, train a zombie, bro. I got a whole train like running on me right now. Ugh. No, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, Satan's the kind of guy to have a pool in the front yard. No, he'd be no, he'd be magma cubes <laughs> from Minecraft. <laughs> you start hopping around. <laughs> you start hopping around. Uh, left. Right, left, 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 lean left, lean left. There's no lean. Hit it! <laughs> lean left. Fuck <laughs> it. Okay, behind us. Where, where okay, is it? Go, go left, 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 left. I, the, 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 look at the fucking road! <laughs> Hearing the difference between us and them is fucking Left. funny. Oh, Will, you're fine. We get it now. I just, I, I, you remind me. I have this clip of you, yeah. fucking talking about this time you got hit at by a gay dude at a bar. Oh yes, yes. That clip is so funny because you're just like, because I'm, I'm sorry, he's not into gay guys, so I'm sorry. Also, he was black. <laughs> you add that in at the very end. I was like, whoa. I almost, I almost believed I, I was. <laughs> well, well I mean, hold on a second. After you say that, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> hey, 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 what do I do? Where the fuck is my canes? Me every day. <laughs> a grandpa. <laughs> Where are my canes? <laughs> <laughs> a vampire that hasn't hit puberty yet. Where are my fangs? Come on. I was, no, no. I was such a low fruit. <laughs> a girl who just cut her hair. Where are my bangs? <laughs>
<laughs> this bed sucks. I wish I didn't have this Jaguar. I so. wish I had this thing. Oh my god, okay. The bitch killed, right? That's it? We're done? gonna hang himself where my uh, hangs. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> when they misplaced their noose. When I go down to Compton, where are my gangs? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> when right, when, when Shotty's got a fat ass, where are my thangs? <laughs> hey! Hold on! <laughs> Me and I don't know how to speak that many languages. Where are my langs? Oh, oh, I need to stop. Me and I race okay, chickens. That... Where are my eggs? <laughs> <laughs> That's so a really good one. Thank you. Trust when you I'm a when I'm a dom and my sub is quiet, where are my bags? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> this is like this fucking <laughs> that fit me when I'm lagging. Papo. Where are my frames? Papo, yeah. Oh my <laughs> god! <laughs> I can't even think <laughs> anymore. <laughs> you keep this, doing this, this bit. <laughs> where are my shames? <laughs> 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 okay, that was probably the best one. Please Thank end you. on that. It will. There is. That is the. That is the bar. There is none above. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. I got one. I got no! one. <laughs> wait, just wait, wait, wait. Me when I'm a celebrity. Where is my oh, fame? Like... <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. I just hit the towers. Where are my planes? <laughs> <laughs> Me when I'm losing a video game and it's completely my fault. Where's my blames? Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> At this point, you just end in plural. Like it doesn't even matter anymore. <laughs> I'm about to say I'm in pain, but you guys are about to turn that into a joke. So no. Yeah. Frostbite during this entire bit. Where's my pains? Ah! <laughs> that doesn't even know. Me when I get back, I got my canes. Yay! Hey, hey, hey. Full circle! Full circle! Please, we ended there. Please! We ended yes. there. We ended yeah, there. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. Marker, what's your favorite animal? My favorite what? Animal. Uh. I don't know. Wait, what's your favorite color? Black. Cool. I'm black, man. Oh my god! I'm black! You get a next one. <laughs> I was playing a uh, dog owner's friend Zink earlier and they both got it and then Makana got it. I was the only one in the lobby not wearing it. I got it first. Don't give them credit. You, I, you all have equal credit. Oh my god, you were talking about dick. What? <laughs> you just get the third thing? <laughs> <laughs> are you talking and thinking about this whole time? Oh, whoa. Ooh, woo. No! <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll go Let's go here. Let's go here. Yes. What? <laughs> no, oh, it's so funny. <laughs> no. -oh. Yeah, what's well, even uh oh? He went no. -oh. <laughs> I am not rut row. No, uh oh. Dude, I'm not even sad. I'm actually quite fucking happy right now because I can finally play my computer again and I have really nice fucking headphones. I, I'm in a good ass mood. I don't know how to make the incorrect buzzer noise, so... <laughs> <laughs> and with that, the 2023 year comes to an end. I don't know how to transition to my outro, so here's to a better 2024. Attack on Titan, Tokyo Ghoul, these hentai babes make me drool. Hashane Biku is great, she makes me masturbate, fairy tale.